Well, thanks for being with us. My name is Sean Riley. I am the Senior Director for Programs with the American Conservative. Welcome to our 10th Annual Foreign Policy Conference. We're excited to have a great lineup for you today and discussing some of the most important and pressing issues facing our country. To introduce the day and to introduce our first panel, I'm going to now turn it over to our Executive Director, Emil Doak. Please welcome Emil Doak. All right, well, thank you, Sean. Uh, we actually have Sean to, to thank for this. Sean's worked tirelessly over the past few months to, to put this together. Uh, so I'm grateful to him for that. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us here. This is our 10th annual Foreign Policy Conference here at the American Conservative. As you may know, our mission at the American Conservative is to advance what we call a Main Street vision for conservatism. We were founded in 2002 to reignite conversations that we felt conservatives had neglected for far too long since at least the end of the Cold War. And if you think back to the political environment in 2002, it's probably not surprising that the foreign policy issue was one of those primary conversations that we felt had been neglected. Our magazine was launched in opposition to the Iraq War and advancing a foreign policy guided by realism and restraint has been a hallmark of our work ever since. Now today, over 20 years later, we're here in the Senate office building, and today's speaker lineup is full of congressmen eager to make the case for a restrained foreign policy that puts American interests first. But this wasn't always the case. As I mentioned before, this is our 10th annual com uh, conference. Your program says the same thing. And I personally was first part of this annual conference back in 2017. That year we held it across town at George Washington University, and we were honored to welcome the late Congressman Walter Jones to give opening remarks that year. Congressman Jones, as, you, as many of you may know, voted in favor of the war in Iraq in 2002, but soon became a fierce opponent of that war and many of our other foreign misadventures. And around the same time as that fourth annual conference in 2017, our magazine uh, featured a piece by Finley Lewis in the November, uh, November December 2017 issue. And in that, uh, in that piece, Congressman jo Jones spoke with Tack and relayed a moving narrative about how he changed his mind on foreign policy after he found himself at a funeral for a local Marine back home in North Carolina. He told Tack, I cried with the widow and it awakened me to what I had done. As our former editor Bob Mary noted at the time, it was a rare acknowledgement of error from a politician here in Washington. And equally rare at the time was Congressman Jones's realist stance on foreign policy. I think it's easy to forget just how much a neoconservative foreign policy dominated the Republican Party at that time. Indeed, the title of that 2017 piece in TAC was Congressional Realists Could Caucus in a Phone Booth. And the subtitle was Meet the Realist Eight. They may be scarce, but they're indomitable. Finley Lewis in that piece wrote that the realists whose default position on questions of foreign policy and national security is one of skepticism about the value of interventions abroad and of respect for privacy at home, quote, don't have a prayer of prevailing in an up or down vote against the neoconservative wing of the party. Now, many of the, those eight realists are no longer in Congress, like Walter Jones and Tennessee's Jimmy Duncan, who addressed the second annual edition of this, con of this conference in 2015. But two of them have since become leaders in the Senate on issues of foreign policy and national security, and you'll hear from them later today, Senator Mike Lee and Senator Rand Paul. And as the program today suggests, the realist caucus, if you will, is quite a bit bigger than its former phone booth size. And it's beginning to have a real impact on foreign policy votes in Congress. We saw this in action last May in the debate over the proper response to Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. There were 57 congressmen then, far more than the eight realists that we had identified in 2017, who were willing to question whether $40 billion in aid to Ukraine was really in the national interest, especially given national security issues like our own porous border that are much closer to home. So we'll talk a lot more today about the proper realist response to that still ongoing crisis in Ukraine. But of course, that aid bill in May still passed, despite the opposition from those, 40, from those 57 Republicans in the House. And we've subsequent, subsequently shipped far more aid than that to Ukraine over the course of the past year. So we've got our work to do, but a more recent vote shows that the Restraint Caucus, if you will, 
has now has much more than just a prayer of prevailing on an up or down vote. As many of you know, just this past March, the Senate dec decisively advanced a bill to repeal the AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, that Congressman Jones and many others voted for to justify the Iraq War in 2002. So we're winning the argument. And today you'll hear many of the leading voices in Congress who are crafting a foreign policy agenda that fulfills that realist and restrained vision and charts a new course that is guided by American interests first. To open our conference today, I wanted to first take a look back at a more retrospective, retrospective look at the foreign policy battles of the recent years. That's the topic of our first conversation, which I'll introduce here in just a second. But first, I want to again thank all of you for being here. I want to encourage you to continue to engage with our work at the American Conservative, whether that's through our website, where we post multiple new feature articles and blog posts every day, our podcasts, uh, you'll hear from one of our podcast co-hosts here shortly, our Constitutional Fellows Program for Young Leaders, and conferences event and events like the one that you're attending here today. I also want to encourage you to stop by the check-in table if you haven't already. We have a lot of goodies there for, for all of you in attendance today, including a copy of our most recent issue of the print magazine that comes out six times a year. We have copies of our 20th anniversary anthology book called Main Street Conservatism, The Future of the Right. Those are for sale at a, a nice little discount for everyone here today. Uh, and it also includes a full section on foreign policy if you're interested in reading more about the magazine's history on this issue. And then you'll also notice on your program, if you are not yet a member of the American Conservative, you're not yet reading Without Limits online and receiving the print magazine in your mailbox, there's a special QR code with a special offer for you to join us as a thank you for attending here today. Now, lastly, before I introduce our panel, I want to thank our sponsors who have made today's event possible, most especially the Stand Together Trust, F. Francis and Dion Najafi of the Pivotal Foundation, as well as Vladimir Egger. So with that, I want to invite our first panel to please come up to our, our tables here, uh, and I will introduce them once they're, they're seated. All right, so for our opening conversation today, a retrospective on restraint in the Trump era. We are pleased to be joined by, uh, furthest to my left, your right, uh, Michael Anton, who is lecturer in politics and research fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center here in Washington, D.C., just around the corner from where we are now. He previously served in national security positions in both the Trump and Bush 43 administrations. And he is the, also the author of the excellent book, if you haven't read it already, you totally should, The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return. Next to Michael is Dan Caldwell. He is vice president at the Center for Renewing America, another excellent organization. He was formerly vice president for foreign policy at Stand Together and a senior advisor to Concerned Veterans for America. Dan is also a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. And last but not least is my colleague, Micah Meadowcroft. He is our web editor here at the American Conservative. He's also co-host of that podcast that I mentioned, TAC Right Now, which you should all be listening to every week. And before joining us at TAC, Micah served as a White House liaison at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency during the Trump administration. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Micah. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Emil. As Emil said, today is dedicated largely to this Congress and looking forward to the future, but we're beginning with a look back to the past. Uh, American foreign policy emerges from, constitutionally speaking, a dance between the president and the Congress, of course, in practice, there is a third party uh, to those negotiations, the permanent bureaucracy. Uh, my interlocutors today are both intimately familiar with this messy three-way dynamic. Um, parts of Trump's instincts were, of course, successfully carried out during the Trump administration regarding putting America first, and we were all very excited to see the, the growth that we continue to see in this Congress and look forward to hearing more about this afternoon. But, of course, other parts were not, and there were a number of uh, missteps and uh, false starts. And so we want to review some of those today. Dan, uh, working with Congress, uh, why don't we start with you? And what's the dynamic or what did you see during the Trump years that prevented uh, a true America first foreign policy from being uh, initiated? Well, thanks, Micah. So I, I just want to start off with my own little nostalgia about the American conservatives. So uh, 20 years ago, um, in the lead up to the Iraq war, I remember going to the Barnes and Noble at 90th street in Shea in Scottsdale, Arizona and reading 
the American conservative and some absolute righteous railings by people like Pat Buchanan and, and Scott McConnell against the Iraq war, a war that I would later serve in. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine uh, back then, 20 years later, I'd be speaking at, at, at one of their events. And uh, it's a real honor. And, and you know, quite frankly, um, uh, I'm a proud to be an Iraq war vet, but I wish more people would have listened to the American conservative and I wouldn't have that title, nor would anyone else. Um, it's also an honor to be here with uh, uh, Michael Anton. Also, just say had a, a fantastic essay in the uh, recent uh, Claremont Review of Books on George Kennan. You should all check it out. Um, but to answer your question, I think that when you're talking about um, the Trump administration, whether you're talking about the executive branch or Congress, and you alluded to this, you have to start with an acknowledgement that there was an unprecedented effort uh, by the president's own appointees the senior leaders of the uniformed military and the permanent national security bureaucracy to thwart the president's foreign policy agenda. And you saw this all play out through things like Russiagate, the Russian uh, bounty hoax in Afghanistan, which was just a blatant attempt by, this, by the intelligence community, the regime media, and members of Congress to stop the president from withdrawing from Afghanistan. You had people like uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey outright lying to the president um, about uh, the number of troops in Syria and then bragging about it. And that was, again, another effort to prevent the president from fulfilling his campaign promises and to withdraw from a war. And in my experience as an outside advocate, I wasn't somebody who served in, in the administration, but I, I um, ran an advocacy group and several major issue campaigns to advance large parts of the president's agenda, both around foreign policy and, and veterans issues as well too, giving veterans choice. I had this very strange um, recurring event where I would be um, launching a campaign to advance something like giving veterans healthcare freedom or getting out of Afghanistan. And I would get calls from people within the administration, either at the, from the VA, uh, from within the State Department, or even within the White House, asking me to stop running a campaign and trying to advance the president's agenda. I want to be clear, it was not a calls like, hey, you guys should use better messaging, or maybe it's a good idea for just strategy's sake that you guys pipe down. It's like, no, could you please stop? I know my boss wants this to happen, but um, it's, you know, we don't like it. And I saw this first with the Department of Veterans Affairs, where you had the first VA secretary, David Shulkin, literally urging the major veteran organizations to oppose giving their veteran, their, their members healthcare choice. You had um, the Mike Pompeo State Department trying to block nominations that the president made, including my uh, a boss at the time, Will Ruger, who's also a board member of the American Conservative. Um, you had the Pompeo State Department getting to Congress, working with members of Congress and the media trying to stop foreign aid rescissions that the president wanted, which my current boss, uh, uh, Russ Vogt, who was director of the Office of Management and Budget, was pushing. And again, something very popular, very common sense, has wide, widely supported. So you repeatedly saw this collusion between these institutions in this town, um, uh, again and again, stopping uh, the president trying to achieve what he wanted in terms of foreign policy. And Congress played a key role in that. Now, I am somebody who believes that Congress has an important role to play in shaping American foreign policy. It's, it's plain as day in, in the Constitution. Congress ultimately declares war. And I want to see Congress voting more on whether or not we send our sons and daughters overseas to fight in conflicts. But that wasn't what was happening most of the time in, in Congress. You did see a bipartisan coalition often come together. Some of the speakers you're going to have later, like Congressman Matt Gates, were involved in it. But more often than not, you saw Congress instead looking to avoid those types of votes and instead colluding with people within the president's administration that did not believe what he did on foreign policy and the media and advanced things like the Cheney Crow Amendment, which was a, um, an amendment uh, that was pushed by, I know she has a lot of fans here, Liz Cheney, uh, and Jim Jason Crow, who is an interventionist Democrat from Colorado, to slow down the president's withdrawal from Afghanistan. And what they used was, as a justification for that, was the fake Russian bounty story. So again, you see that collusion. And you also saw uh, when President Trump tried to withdraw from Syria at the end of 2019, 
instead of voting up or down on an authorization for that mission, they voted for a resolution, a two-foot resolution condemning it. And you had the current uh, House Speaker vote for that, I just point out. And you had the majority Republicans in Congress. So they had a role to play in shaping American foreign policy. They had power to use. But they instead chose to go outside of what the Constitution had Congress, what, what the Constitution dictated that, that, that Congress should do in foreign policy and collude essentially with the permanent national security bureaucracy, the media, to try and undermine the president. And I don't think you can have a, a conversation about what was accomplished without first acknowledging that. Uh, thank you. Michael, since, you're, uh, since you left the National Security Council in 2018, you've spent the last five years, I think one of the questions animating your writing has been, you know, who the hell's actually in charge here, uh, especially in the executive branch. Could you speak to, you know, your year at the NSC in the Trump administration, what did you see and then what have you observed since then about how American foreign policy is actually made um, and what we can do to change it? It's, it's made largely, I think, on, on autopilot. And I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. I, I have arguments with smarter friends who think my answer is wrong. So I'm going to subject this, leave this open to future revision. But the way it looks to me now is no one's in charge, but a doctrine or a set of ideas is in charge that has no central author, that everyone just sort of knows the script. And they don't need to be told. The analogy I like to use is we've all seen a huge flock of birds all flying in one direction, and they all change direction at exactly the same time, amazingly, and go in a 90 degree angle. And there's no radio connecting each bird brain to the other bird brains. They just somehow know how to do it. And that's how foreign policy is made in Washington. You, you just know what you're supposed to be for, if you're, you know, what your role is. So if you're a military officer, you know, you know what the broader policy is, you know what you're supposed to do. If you're a desk officer at the State Department, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, there are constitutional powers and and enumerated powers, Article II powers for the, the executive. And by the way, just as an aside, I want to say, if you really want Congress to exercise its uh, role, which I do, but uh, leaving aside the declaration of war, which I agree, I'd love to see them do that again, although in this, in, 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 only in the abstract sense. That is to say, I don't want them to declare war because I don't want to go to war. But they ought to at least exercise that enumerated power over whether or not we do. But if you really want to see them assert their power over foreign policy, they need to use their power of the purse and stop funding the federal bureaucracy for things they don't want it to do. And they're terrified of doing that and they won't do it. So, you know, Congress, you actually have power. It's there. I can show you the passages because I have to teach this to undergraduates exactly where it says you get to do these things. Just assert it and see what happens. But they never want to do that. Anyway, the, the problems of the Trump administration actually started before the Trump administration in the summer of 2016 when some neocons organized these letters. They're, everybody, well, people have actually forgotten this. I had to explain this a number of times recently. It's not that long ago. Uh, there was one, and I think there were two. There were at least two, let me put it that way, which had in total, I think the first one had about 150 signatories. The next one had 75, 80. So the way it works in Washington is in foreign policy, really all government positions is when an administration comes in and it needs to make appointments, it just starts appointing the people who served in the last administration of that party. But you get a, if, if you make the cut, you get a bump up. So if you were an assistant secretary eight years ago, a new administration comes in, you get to be an undersecretary. Or you just remain a lobbyist or a law partner because you're, you're making too much money, or the new administration doesn't want you, or whatever. But when you have, so there's this stable of people in both parties that are just ready and waiting to go back into government. But at least 200 of them, more like 225, 250, had signed letters with their, you know, their names, not, not anonymously, saying, I will not work for this administration under any circumstances. So right off the bat, you had this crippling problem of who are you going to find, which is related to the second problem is that Trump ran against the Republican establishment on foreign policy. So yes, you, you can't easily turn to the people from the last Bush administration, which was the W. Bush administration, because they didn't, those people didn't agree with anything Trump said he wanted to do. So where are you going to find all these people? Now, looking forward, I know we're supposed to look back, but looking forward, if there ever is another Republican administration, I'm on record as saying I don't think there will be, but I'm a doomer and I'm probably wrong. If there ever is one, this problem will be easier to solve because the bench is larger and deeper. But it was, it was very difficult to do in 2016, 17, until you end up getting a lot of people who shouldn't be there and who believe the doctrine or whatever the set of ideas is that just sort of magically uh, informs foreign policy. 
And, you know, Mike Flynn was an exception. Mike Flynn did not. He believed in what Trump wanted to do. And he had a lot of experience in the bureaucracy. And, you know, you all know the story of how he got taken out. I mean, we're, you want to talk about criminal prosecutions. I mean, apparently Trump is about to get indicted some, maybe on Friday, I don't know. It seems like the special prosecutor is going to indict him for having some ridiculously overclassified material at his home in Mar-a-Lago, which disclosed something unbelievable like what Angela Merkel had for lunch in, you know, July 2018. I don't know what it says, but if it's actually, having looked at a lot of classified material, I'm telling you, the chances that this really discloses something super sensitive that would harm the national security of the United States, they're not zero, but they're close. Anyway, somebody in the Obama administration, not in the Obama administration, somebody really close to the president, like, you know, we're talking about a universe of 10 or 12 people max, leaked FISA transcripts of, on Mike Flynn's telephone conversations in December and January of 2016, 2017. That's a really serious super felony, okay? Never been investigated. Nobody's ever been charged. Nobody's ever gonna be charged. And Flynn was drummed out of the administration in 24 days. So one of the few people that the president had who understood his agenda and was gonna to try to faithfully implement it, they fixed on and got rid of quickly. Right? And then when you don't have anybody in there trying to kind of fight the miasma of what the blob is my, one of the few times I'm going to quote Ben Rhodes approvingly, wants, right, you can't. It, it's really all but impossible to do. And that, that, was, that was the major. Now, Trump was getting a handle on that as the administration went through, you know, uh, and by the last year. I think everyone, the president and everyone around him realized the depth of the problem and were really working to change things. And had there been a second term, I think you would have seen a vastly different second term. Um, well, you, you would have seen personnel-wise a vastly different second term. But that does lead me, I'll just make this point and then stop, is, you know, even with that said, I, I think Trump was more or less faithful to the policies that he ran on in 2016 during his first term. The major exception is that he didn't withdraw from Afghanistan. And yes, he didn't because everyone around him was against it. Um, but in the end of the day, he personally could have said, I, I've heard you. I've listened to every argument you made. I've carefully considered it. I, I, I believe they were all made in good faith, et cetera, et cetera, nonetheless. Given these other reasons, we're getting out. I'm giving you a direct order. You must follow it. He never did that in four years. And in a way, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that was his decision not to make that decision. But when Biden gave the order in August of 2021, which the national security bureaucracy didn't want to hear and didn't want to implement, they were finally cornered and had no choice but to implement the order. I personally believe, this is the conspiracy theorist in me, that they implemented it as badly as possible in a fit of peak in order to make him look bad and to show him the error of his ways or so they thought. Like, you know, oh, you want me to clean my room? Well, I'm gonna, I'll clean it by burning it down or something. It was kind of there. But, you know, mostly Trump didn't run on being um, a complete non-interventionist or to use the, a bad word from former ages, an isolationist. He told you where he was going to be interventionist and where he wasn't, and I think he mostly stuck to that. Dan, do you want to add to that? I, I, uh, I think, uh, Michael, your point on what happened with Afghanistan with, with Biden, I think, is, is the uh, right one. I, I do think that, that it's worth noting that the people that ultimately executed the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the people that were responsible, so... You know, General Milley isn't technically in the chain of command, but he still is in charge of planning. Uh, people like General McKinsey, they were all the people in the, in the Trump administration who were trying to stop withdrawal as they fought him tooth and nail. Uh, there is actually evidence that, that uh, Axios did a, a report on this, that General Milley was colluding with the Afghan government to stop President Trump from withdrawing in December. Again, I, I, would, I would throw out there that had... Um, the withdrawal in December or January of uh, 2020 and then 2021 happened, it would have been less chaotic because it occurred in the winter. Uh, the Taliban would have been um, um, at home uh, and, or in their resting areas and uh, wouldn't have been prepared to launch a, a rapid counteroffensive. I think the end result would have been, been the same, but it would have maybe been a little less chaotic. Um, one thing that, that I would, I would uh, just foot stomp as well too is your point about General Flynn. And I think that, you know, I know that you're pessimistic about um, the possibility of another Republican administration. 
But if we do have that opportunity, and it is with a president that ultimately wants to fundamentally change American foreign policy, it is before you can do that, you absolutely have to bring the national security bureaucracy to heel so that something like that doesn't happen and that they aren't fighting you every day. So in the lead up to that, we're talking about Congress and, and you brought up appropriations. I'm glad you did is, you know, I, our group was opposed to the, the, the recent debt limit deal because we think it actually undermines the appropriations process. Um, you know, we hope that we can get back to that, but there is an opportunity for this Republican Congress to use that process to at least start to bring them to heel. And then on day one, we have the plans ready to go so that we can do what we can to be in check. And again, I know that you're a doomer on this, but. Yeah. I have three very simple fixes for the national security bureaucracy. Very simple and actually doable and within reach, potentially, okay? You're not gonna reform the State Department, the Foreign Service, I mean, maybe over the long terms, over generations. It reminds me one of these, I like quoting this line. It was from a review of a book by Tom Wolfe, I love Tom Wolfe, and the reviewer whose name I forgot said, Tom Wolfe, one of his great ambitions was to set out to reform the New York literary establishment. He did not succeed, but that's like trying to bring democracy to Russia, okay? Reforming the State Department, the Foreign Service, et cetera, all these places, that, that's like trying to bring democracy to Russia. If you set that as your goal, right, you're not gonna do it within four years. However, here's what you can do very, very quickly. Number one, the president's, mo the people who have the most direct control even though it's technically indirect, but really is direct and work directly for the president, are the National Security Council staff. They're in the White House with him. They report directly to him in the chain of command. They see him more than anybody else. They travel with him and so on and so forth. Because of dumb budgetary reasons, the National Security Council staff is, I don't know what it is now, but when I left, it was still about 85% detailees. That means people that come from other agencies of the government are sent over to the White House. They remain loyal to that agency of the government, wherever they're from, and to the the, the Borg way of thinking about foreign policy. So you have 85% of this organization that's inside the White House that's supposed to be loyal to the president implementing his agenda, wanting to do something else. So Republicans are always ag aghast and appalled at the idea of spending money. Properly, I get that, but they can be um, myopic on this point. Here's one place where you're gonna need to spend some money and it's not that much. I'm talking about maybe $200 million. In federal budgetary terms, it's couch cushion change. Give the National Security Council staff the budget enough money so the president can hire people and not be forced to rely on detailees, okay? Section two, you, all of those people have to have a top secret SCI security clearance, and the security clearance has been weaponized as a way to keep out staff members that you don't want. I experienced, not personally, but I experienced this myself where we had good people turned away because they, they would not be cleared. Another way you do it is uh, your full field background investigation, well, if we like the guy, we'll get it done in a, in a couple of weeks, six weeks, I mean, two months. If we don't, ah, it could be 18 months, who knows, right? And then the seat's unfilled, okay? Again, this is gonna take a little bit of money, not much, much less than 200 million. Give the NSC security office is run by detailees. Let it hire its own team of 10 or 12 investigators. They do all the investigations. That means no putting it at the bottom of the pile if you don't want to get this guy cleared. All they do is focus on NSC staff who are personally chosen by the president as national security advisor. And so that the speed, you know, they're dedicated to it and they have his best interest at heart. And then number three, real simple thing, right? It shows you how, how gamey Washington really is. The very tail end of the Obama administration, he wrote a letter I'm not sure what the legal status of this is. I've never been able to figure that out, but it's not a law, I know that, it's not a statute. Basically saying that the director of the Central Intelligence Agency shall have the uh, authority to approve or reject anyone's SCI. In other words, you could get a full field background check all the way up to top secret, but if you don't get that little backslash SCI after it, you can't work in the NSC staff. And that power resides with the front office of the CIA who can just look at a name and go, Joe Smith, Oh, he's a bad guy. He's, you know, he was against this or that. Or that. No, no SCI. And they'll come up with a reason. They're not going to say it's because he's a bad guy. It's going to be, you know, he left something out on his desk once uh, overnight in a skiff with the door locked. But number, nevertheless, it was a violation and therefore he can't have it, right? Take that power back. Just take it away. Don't let the CIA have that power over your personal staff. You do all three of these things, you can have a staff of two or 300 people inside the White House, completely loyal to the president and his agenda. And then those people will be a force to be reckoned with by the rest of the bureaucracy that will want to fight with them, as opposed to being essentially spies and enablers of the bureaucracy within the White House, which is what we have now. So 
to uh, continue that personnel problem story, uh, Dan, would you tell a little bit about the, the Will Ruger confirmation fight? Yeah, so um, uh, Will Ruger, who at the time was, was my boss at Stand Together, um, was nominated by President Trump to be uh, ambassador to Afghanistan. Uh, Will was a prominent advocate of withdrawing from Afghanistan and, and really a prominent advocate of pursuing more, a more realist foreign policy. And uh, because um, the president had wisely made some ch changes in the presidential personnel office in the last year of his administration, you had people like uh, Johnny McEntee going out and actually finding people who wanted to ultimately pursue a foreign policy more in line with what the president wanted. And so they uh, wanted to go ahead and nominate a will to be ambassador to Afghanistan. Uh, they made this decision in the early months of COVID, and it was very clear this is what the president wanted. It had been signed off, and almost right away, you saw the Pompeo State Department dragging feet. Um, you had people from Mike Pompeo's office trying to stir up opposition in Congress. Um, we can't confirm this, but we think that there were people that leaked out news of his nomination early to try and undermine it. And then when the nomination was, was formally made and transmitted to Congress, you saw the bureaucracy kick into action. So there was delay in getting um, uh, paperwork to Congress, they're getting all the things that they needed for, for, co for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to start holding hearings and, and to get the process going. So ultimately, there wasn't even a hearing on, on Will's nomination. The same applied to several other ambassadorships and key national security positions like Colonel Douglas McGregor. His nomination to, to Germany was held up. And again and again, you saw this um, with the Pompeo State Department. And I think that, that he is a, I don't use this term lightly, he, he was a, a, a particularly um, villainous figure in the last couple years of the Trump administration, really maybe all four years, um, in regards to foreign policy. Uh, I, I mentioned the, 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 the story about what he did around rescissions, um, where he was working with members of Congress, like Senator Lindsey Graham and, and, and Hal Rogers to stir that up, and outside groups as well, too. You actually may have seen some of them uh, walking around today. They're lobbying Congress for more foreign aid, the United States uh, Global Leadership Coalition. Um, so, again, I, I, the Trump administration does deserve some blame for not pushing through these things earlier and taking more decisive action on these things. But um, it's another example about how these personnel processes were weaponized. Now, Will had a clearance. He, was a, he is still a, a, a Naval Reserves Intelligence officer, so he didn't have to go through that process again. He had experience overseas. But there was that um, effort, uh, uh, not just by the Pompeo political appointees, but the bureaucracy within the State Department to slow this down. And, uh, you know, just real quick, one, one, one experience I had with Will um, prior to Will being uh, nominated that really sticks out in my brain that I think hammers home how hostile a lot of people within the president's own White House were to his um, foreign policy views is that in 2019, we were asked to have a meeting in the National Security Council with our outreach team. And so myself and Will, another uh, colleague of mine at the time, we met in and we met with two people from, from the uh, National Security Council. And these are people that, that normally will meet with groups like the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, all the blobby think tanks downtown. And they asked Will, you know, what do you guys believe in? They, you know, what are your key issues? And we walk through them all. And at the end of the meeting, there's a smirk on this one guy's face who I won't name. Um, and he, he said, <laughs> he said, he said, uh, um, just, you know, no joking in his, his voice. He says, you guys agree more with that guy over there pointing over to the White House here in the executive office building than we do. And it, you should have seen, I wish I were recorded it because you should have seen the look on Will's face. It's like everything that he knew was true was just confirmed in that moment. And it was, it was truly an incredible experience to me. And fortunately, those, most of those people were fired in the coming months because they were Bolton people. But still... That just was a constant issue that I ran into in trying to work with the administration from the outside and advance those priorities. From a public discourse perspective, probably the biggest shift uh, on foreign policy during the Trump administration is China. Uh, you know, everyone is now willing to talk about China in, 
and they know they have to. They know that the, the electorate wants them to. And now, of course, there's a lot of jockeying for position to s decide who's the most uh, China hawkish in the right way, well, whether we're using terms like decoupling or uh, cooperative disentanglement or advocating for an actual conflict over, say, Taiwan. Um, how did that change in conversation happen? And where do you two, now speaking less from perhaps your experience and more from your own reflections on these issues, where do you two see the conversation going uh, within the ongoing Republican fight over its own identity as a party? Well, the cynical uh, answer to the question of how did it change, I'm not sure I believe, but I will state it anyway. Uh, because there was a sudden turn where the ruling class, which had been pro-economic integration with China, pretty much across the board since, I don't know, 1979, um, by the middle of Trump's term had said, we're, we're done, not only are we done with that, now it's time for a major confrontation with China. So the cynical explanation goes something like, we've gotten all we can economically out of the Chinese. The labor costs are now so high that you don't actually save money by outsourcing there much anymore. Um, the, the grand dreams of getting into the massive, you know, 1.3 billion person Chinese market and making your uh, money over there is never going to happen because they're too protectionist and they won't let us in. So there's no, nothing further to be gained by further economic integration. And, you know, the, the Russia thing isn't working out that much because even if they're terrible, they're just not that strong. So we need a new boogeyman to scare the hell out of everyone and justify what we're doing and let's make it China. Um, most of the reason I, that I don't believe that necessarily is because it gives too much credit to perspicacity and foresight in a ruling class that I don't find much evidence has uh, much evidence that has either. Um, it, it is true though that the, the conversation changed dramatically and I think that's about half good and half bad. The, the half good part that is encouraging but was only really working well when Trump was around and in office, and he was quite clear on this, is the confrontation with China needs to be an economic confrontation that even if companies from their own self-interests, you know, outsource less and depend on them less for supply chains and so on, there's still a ton of, um, uh, you know, product dumping, intellectual property theft, industrial espionage, all these kinds of things are going on that we are not sufficiently fighting against and we need to have that con confrontation and win on those terms. What Donald Trump, I think, was pretty supremely uninterested in during his time was war with China over Taiwan over anything else. And this obviously irritated a lot of his critics and irritates them to this day. And, you know, I've gotten, I've been called an appeaser, literally an appeaser, simply for pointing out that the Chinese can sink a U.S. aircraft carrier if we wanted to, if they really wanted to get into it in the Taiwan Strait, they could sink a U.S. aircraft carrier. Now, the, the Gerald R. Ford, I think, at the end of the day, cost about $15 billion. When you have the wing, okay, typically four squadrons, whether they're F-18, uh, F Super Hornets or F-35s on board, you're looking at something like $20 billion, and let's say 6,000 guys, 5,500 minimum. That's a pretty big loss to take, right? And the American people have not suffered such a loss since 1942. And, and a, sm a greatly smaller amount of money adjusted for inflation and, real and plus people, and they were in a gigantic war that an adversary clearly started. I just pointed this out. Like, are we really ready for something like that over something, let's face it, is a much more of a vital interest to China than it is to us. It's not to say that like Taiwan is irrelevant to the United States or that I would just gladly, you know, give as if it were ours to give, give Taiwan to the Chinese. But if, if you're looking just at the world as a chessboard long term, the Chinese position in terms of retaking Taiwan is a heck of a lot stronger over the decades or centuries than anyone else's position is in preserving Taiwan from a Chinese takeover if they want to do it for, for simple reasons of proximity, military balance, all kinds, of, all kinds of things, and how much the ruling class of each nation and the relative populations of each nation cares about it. So you, you, I point these things out just to wonder, like, if the, if the, you know, the anti-Chinese rhetoric continues to be more security and less economic, where does that, it could end up leading us somewhere really dumb that I, I, I wonder if anybody actually intends. Like, do they just think it's kind of valuable to talk about a war with China, maybe potentially, and to, to look tough and not sound like an appeaser? Or do they actually want to do it? My, my, my sense is it's more the former, but you often end up with the latter when you're not careful how you behave and how you talk on the world stage. I just quickly add that, that I, you know, on the, on the record saying that I think, you know, China is our primary national security challenge. Uh, it is a real competitor, um, and it does pose real threats to us. Uh, but I, I agree with Michael that it is primarily an economic challenge, 
and that a military conflict would be disastrous. And Michael did a very good job of, of laying out the costs of what it'd be like to, to sink an American aircraft carrier. I also point out too is that, that adopting a Cold War mindset with China, I think would have a lot of negative implications back here at home. Um, my, my former colleague, uh, Reed Smith, wrote a great paper about this in a foreign policy, I encourage you to read. But I think it could be used by the permanent national security bureaucracy that we've just discussed as another reason to do things like expand surveillance powers. Now the FBI needs millions, if not billions of more dollars to fight Chinese espionage, which don't get me wrong, is a real risk. But just like we saw after 9-11, they would inflate that and use it as an excuse to gain more power. I'd also just finally say too, I, I don't actually believe that a lot of the China hawks around town uh, there are some people that have really thought about this this problem in, in I think, a, a very thorough and thoughtful way, people like Bridge Colby. Uh, but there are others that are China hawks because they actually want to use China as an excuse to keep doing things in other areas of the world, like the Middle East. Like, we can't pull out of the Middle East or, or China will come in, which, in my opinion, would be awesome. Have fun in Iraq and Syria. Um, we, you know, we have to defeat Putin in um, uh, Ukraine because it sends a message to China. We have to, uh, I've literally heard people argue that we need to be more involved in Moldova, you know, because uh, China could get a foothold there. So, but when they actually, when you actually press them on what should we be doing in, in the, the Pacific and what should we be doing economically to deal with this issue, they have literally nothing in most cases. So that, that's kind of my broader thoughts about China. I just caution everybody here that it's not an easy issue. It's not a straightforward issue. And I, I think that a lot of people in the national security establishment, whether in government or Northwest DC, their, their brains are still so much built to think about the Middle East and Europe that they, they, are, they don't have incentives to think about China in a thoughtful way. And I think that's, that's very scary for a lot of reasons. By the way, I just want to clarify one little thing. Uh, my friend Jim Hansen is here in the audience. He disagrees with me about Taiwan and has written about it. I hope he does not believe it. None of you should believe that when I said I had been called an appeaser, I was referring to him. He didn't do that. It was Michael Pillsbury who called me an appeaser uh, at the second NatCon. It's on YouTube if you want to watch it. In the lead up to and first weeks of Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year, um, a lot of effort was put into forgetting a lot of history and, and, and making sure that the American public was completely unaware of even very recent history, right? Uh, 2014 and the Maidan Revolution, et cetera. Um, there was a pause. Like, the US foreign policy seemed already fixated on Ukraine specifically, but Russia generally, uh, under the late Obama administration. And there was a pause of sorts, though of course we had the Russia hoax continuing it during the Trump administration. So Michael, would you speak to, you know, where did that pause come from? What was going on? Yeah, is this directly I, continuous? I don't know exactly what you mean by a pause because here, okay, here's this is another example of, I, you want to use the word failure? I don't know, but a place where the Trump action didn't match its rhetoric. Now, some, that is to say, Trump wanted better relations with Russia and he really didn't want the United States to be doing anything in Ukraine, okay? To the extent that, when he would get um, jawboned extensively by European leaders saying, why aren't you doing more in Ukraine? And he would say, well, why aren't you doing more in Ukraine? You care about it more than I do, and it's closer to you than it is to me. So you coming to me and, and, and you know, basically lecturing me, uh, it, it didn't have a lot of a, a great effect on him. However, when he was pushed to up arm sales and do things, he did it, reluctantly. I don't think they ever, I don't think the people around him, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and others ever really convinced him that this was a wise thing to do, right? They just wore him down, is my gut sense of it. And he, he did it. And then because of, this was, the, in a way, the genius of the Russia hoax, right? Well, let's back up. I mean, the, the Russia hoax was, I think, partly intended, obviously it was intended to make sure he wasn't president. That didn't work, right? Well, you, you can't let all that hard work go to waste, so I uh, had to use it for something. And they used it to make it completely impossible to do anything that eased U.S.-Russia tensions. Because if he did, you know, all he had to do was, like, shake Putin's hand in Hamburg. I was there for this. And they would completely flip out, right? You're a Russian spy. I mean, literally this happened. So he had this long meeting with Putin in Hamburg. The press made a story about the fact that it was really long. Like, why was he in there for so long? Like, they were talking? They've never met? I don't know. So then at later that same night, there's a dinner with all the leaders. This is the G20, I guess. So there's 20 leaders there. 
and they're all seated somewhere, and it's not up to the president where he gets seated. And when the dessert course serves, people start getting up and going around and talking. And Putin apparently got up and he walked over to Trump and, you know, talked to him for a couple of minutes before he sat down and ate his dessert. And the press made this into a scandal. It's hidden secret second meeting that the White House refuses to disclose. What was said at the second meeting? Like, I don't know. He said, what do you think of the raspberry compote? I mean, people are insane. Anyway, the point was, anything you do, anything you do to be the slightest bit friendly or just non-confrontational with Russia, we're going to call you a traitor. And that put tremendous pressure on him to keep the sanctions high, to increase the sanctions, to give lethal aid to Ukraine, to close consulates, expel diplomats, many of whom undoubtedly were actually spies under diplomatic cover. There's no doubt about it. But it made his overall uh, intention toward, as he put it himself, getting along with Russia, made that impossible. So when you say pause, I mean, I'm just reluctant to accept that in, in part because you know, I think had Trump really done what he wanted to do when they came to him in the summer of 2017 and said, we're going to start giving Javelin anti-tank missiles to Ukraine, he, he would have told them no. And he tried to tell them no, and they warmed down. But at the end of the day, that was his call, not, that, not something that he would have self-generated from within, but, you know, you're, you get these kinds of jobs, you're going to be put under tremendous pressure by everybody around you, even though you're the president, you're the only one who was elected, you definitely have the highest stature and status of everyone in the room. It's still hard to maintain, um, you know, the, the, uh, to maintain opposition against this phalanx of, of people all telling you you got to be doing something else. Do you want to add to that, Dan? Yeah, I, I agree with Michael is that, that you know, I, I don't, there, there was not a fundamental break with um, in terms of actual substance policy with the, the Russia policy of the Obama administration and the later years of the Bush administration during, during the four years of President Trump. I think the president wanted to do that. And I, I think the difference was the rhetoric. And that is what freaked out the blob so much. But to say that, that Trump was you know, weak on Russia, in large part, the policies were what um, you know, more hawkish elements of the national security uh, establishment wanted. And that's, that's the reality. So I, I bring that up in the fact that, that there's been some implication by some, you know, never Trump uh, neocons ghouls who, you know, in a, in a, in a, a righteous country wouldn't, uh, you know, ever be given a magazine column or control of a major publication again. But, you know, here we are. Um, that that somehow the weakness of the Trump administration led to this this point that we are now in in Ukraine, and I I, I think that is just utterly absurd. Um, you know, he gave them javelin missiles when Obama wouldn't, and and he you know continued lethal aid and increased it. Uh, there was continued training of the Ukrainian military by the United States military. Um, it, it 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 all was actually ramped up. Um, what I think ultimately that is, is doing, though, is to distract away from the fact that the Biden administration bears responsibility for what happened in Ukraine. And also, I, I want to be fair, like 30 years of bad post-Cold War foreign policy with NATO expansion, uh, with keeping the, the open door to Ukraine and, and so on and so forth. But it was the Biden administration, their mixed messaging, you know, we're not going to put troops on the ground, but we're going to defend European and territorial integrity that, you know, framing this as this existential fright, fight between democracy and autocracy, which I just have to say is just one of the stupidest things you ever hear. You, Ukraine, it, you know, they are a victim of Russian aggression, but let's be honest, they are corrupt, illiberal, increasingly authoritarian state, and they are becoming more authoritarian by the day because that's what happens during extended periods of war. So I I just find this conversation about Trump and Russia, it. it you know, if you have it too much, I, I worry it can cause long-term brain damage. Is that dumb? <laughs> I think we have time for one, possibly two questions from the audience. Do we have a microphone for John to pass around? And if you'd like to ask that question, and it better be a question, not a comment. Um, John, don't give up control of the mic. <laughs> There. 
Hi, thank you for your remarks. Um, my question is, what do we do about the personnel problem? Because it seems as if one of the issues we have with getting people of a more realist bent into these top level positions in presidential administrations and so on is that most of the people who know what they're doing and have the credentials for those positions are coming out of these same institutions. I mean, whether we're seeing you know, problems with the military and how you know, far it's gone or you know, the national security state, State Department, it seems like there's a difficult path for people to go into these agencies or whatever and then get into an administration um, who are actually going to be on the side of that sort of administration. Well, look, I, as I said, it's going to be easier if there is another Republican administration than it was the last time because, uh, first of all, there's a number of projects working on this to identify who was good in the Trump administration, who was bad, right? Who should be on this list, who shouldn't be? Other people who maybe weren't in the administration but who wrote, who spoke, who you know are on the record, like they're just going to be a, a bench and, a, and lists of many, many, many more hundreds of names than there were the first time. So that's point one. Um, point two is I think a future administration needs to be a lot less concerned, certainly in positions that don't require Senate confirmation, with credentialing. It's like, well, you, you, you don't have the, quite the resume yet to be X, Y, or Z, and you're too young. Right? Just, I'm not saying everybody should be 21 years old in the National Security Council staff, but be, they, they're going to need to be a little looser about that than prior administrations have been, because then all you end up with is you know, an administration that looks like the board of Goldman Sachs or the Harvard Board of Overseers, or as it was you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and that, that's not that helpful. The, the, the deeper problem, which I don't really know the answer to, is is it wise to encourage young people to, let's say, go into the Foreign Service, the intelligence community, or the military when things are the way they are? And this is directly personal to me because I'm a college professor, right? So I teach kids, and I teach classes on strategy and national security. And every semester, at least one, sometimes two, will come Three or more will say, wow, that's fascinating. I'd like to do that for a living. Like, how did you get into it? What should I do? Maybe I'm going to go into OCS. Maybe I'm going to you know, see if I can join this, the, the clandestine service or take the foreign service exam. And on the one hand, it would be good for all of us if we had more people do this and try to rise through the ranks and get that bureaucratic experience and credential themselves. On the other hand, like, do you want it on your conscience that you said to somebody, you know, go join the deep state the way it is now? Right, I, and then he comes back five years later. Is like you told me to go into the foreign <laughs> service. Look at me, man. Like I, I'd feel bad, right? So, it's, you know, or do we? You know, we want to just be honest with people. Like you're, you're going to be making a serious sacrifice, but maybe you're doing it for some greater good. Uh, I, I, I just don't know where exactly I come down on that, and I, I pose that as a dilemma. I don't have the answer. I think Michael covered this pretty well. There are some great talent building efforts going on. I think the Heritage Project 2025 is really off to a good start. And, you know, you're going to see them not, you know, uh, having you already have seen them get people involved uh, with this project that, let's be honest, maybe five, six years ago under different heritage leadership would not have been involved on the national security front. So that's heartening. Uh, there is now, I think, a true counter elite in American foreign policy. You have a lot of new institutions like Defense Priorities, like the Quincy Institute. You now have, have serious uh, uh, restrainers at organizations like the Carnegie Gowan and Stimson Center. Um, and there are more and more of these, these people that are in the national conversation. And you also have more people who are identified and in, in many ways credentialed to serve in these roles. Um, I would just add, and Michael actually touched on some of these earlier, is that you also need to get the clearance process uh, uh, under control. I think Michael had a great idea there. Um, you also need to get the classification issue. We at Center for Newing America released a paper uh, earlier this year about, about how to reform that so that information can be shared more easily between different groups of people than administration. And then finally, you need reforms like Schedule F that you can get these policy-making positions across the permanent bureaucracy in a place where a president can actually appoint people to a policy-making position. And, Regardless of what some people in, in the mainstream media would say, this isn't about like making everybody an at-will employee across the federal government so that you can appoint everybody from a forest firefighter in Montana all the way up to Secretary of Defense. This is a reform at specific positions that create policy which should be appointed by elected representatives of the American people. I would just add one other little thing, which is we need Congress, if they are, are willing and able and so on, 
they need to use their statutory power to reduce the number of positions in the federal government that require Senate confirmation. This has been done in the past, okay? In the first term of George, and I, I, this is the only time I'm aware of, but I'm sure it's also been done at other times, of George W. Bush, they actually pulled back some requirements of Senate con confirmation of certain assistant secretaryships throughout the government. I, obviously, every secretary should be Senate confirmed. Every deputy should be Senate, Senate confirmed. You know, unders, uh, I suppose. Does every single assistant secretary, all of these positions, I think a lot, now the Senate doesn't want to give this up because it's power. We can put unrelated holds on person X, Y, or Z until I get what I want from this administration over there, right? But if, if we ever have united government again, this should be high on the agenda because leaving aside every other problem that we've talked about, you know, who's that guy at Brookings? Paul Light. He writes every at the beginning of every new administration, he, he, he writes about how it takes longer and longer and longer. Right? It used to take a couple of months, then six months, now it's like a year. We're going to be at a point where as a first term is coming to an end, right? there are still open positions that have had nominees for three or four years that the Senate hasn't acted on. And it's just is ridiculous. And this is something that Congress, if it wanted to, could help fix. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Michael. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Micah. Thank you to our, our first panel. We are going to keep rolling now into the first of two of our featured addresses here today. We'll have a break after this for lunch, uh, but now we're going to keep the, the program going. And I have the honor of introducing Senator Mike Lee. Senator Mike Lee of Utah was first elected in 2010, and he has spent his career defending the fundamental liberties of all Americans and advocating for America's founding constitutional principles. Senator Lee graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in political science and from BYU's law school in 1997. He then went on to serve as law clerk with future Supreme Court Justice and Samuel Alito on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Throughout his career, Senator Lee has earned a reputation as an outstanding practitioner of the law based on his sound judgment, abilities in the courtroom, and thorough understanding of the Constitution. Senator Lee serves as the ranking Republican on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Competition Policy, and Consumer Rights, in addition to serving on the Energy and Natural, Natural Resources Subcommittee on Public Lands, Forests, and Mining, and the Committee on the Budget. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we at the American Conservative have long admired Senator Lee's principled stand for constitutional foreign policy, and we're honored to have him join us here today. Please join me in welcoming Senator Mike Lee. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And it's always welcoming when I come into a room like this and I can see the backdrop, the American conservative. You know, you ever have that dream when you were in high school or college that you show up uh, for school, either uh, not fully clothed or, or even worse, uh, you show up for finals and all of a sudden you realize that you hadn't studied for that class for an entire semester and then you wake up in a cold sweat. That's the dream that I have today that's the variation of that is I show up to one of these and start giving a speech only to look back and discover that I'm speaking at a group called the American Progressive. Uh, that, that wouldn't be fun. It would be different. Uh, I just came over from voting. My, my wife Sharon sometimes jokes that whenever she comes with me to Washington, as soon as we step off the plane uh, at DCA, uh, she said that I walk much faster uh, as soon as we land here than uh, we do in Utah, it's because we're constantly going back and forth between votes. And that happens sometimes. Uh, and, and it also describes uh, the speed uh, with which we sometimes get involved in conflicts. And it's to that weakness that I wish to direct many of my remarks today. I want to th uh, thank the American Conservative for hosting this event and for all of you for being here. It's uh, uh, good for conservatives to get together and talk about what it means to be a conservative, what it is that we're conserving, why it is that the things that we're trying to conserve need to be conserved, and what the risks are for not conserving them. The questions that arise regarding America's role in the world 
have always been beset by tension from the very founding of our republic. And, and appropriately so. Uh, these should be things that we wrestle with because they're not easy. And when we try to pretend that they're easy, when we try to force the concept of their being easy, we make other things hard, much harder than they should be. I think John Quincy Adams captured it uh, quite well in his famous speech given nearly 202 years ago, uh, just a few hundred yards from here in the Capitol. America, he said, quote, goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. America is, quote, a well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all, but remains the champion and vindicator only of her own, close quote. The same tension bedevils us now, not quite to the same degree that it should, but it does, it's still here. In fact, it's a tension that needs to be embraced, it needs to be rekindled from time to time, it needs to be reawakened. And we need to be asking these difficult questions, like how best do we secure American sovereignty while exemplifying liberty abroad? How do we unite ourselves with freedom, ideally at a, at a hegemonic scale, without taking on the burden of empire? Now, neoconservatives have one approach. Uh, they, they would have us believe that the answer to this tension is a foreign policy that necessarily places America at the tip of every spear and leverages American sweat, blood, tears, and treasure for an ever-expanding, always morphing definition of what's in our national interest. Liberal internationalists, meanwhile, take a slightly different approach. They maintain that it's the international community of global elites who should define when, where, and how, and to what extent America uses its power. Then you've got the isolationists, uh, uh, who, who embrace a foreign policy that tends to sort of shrug at uh, geopolitics, at international affairs generally, believing instead that domestic tranquility will be secured if we just leave well en enough alone. I don't fit neatly into any of these categories. And instead, I, I, I categorize myself as something else, as a constitutional realist. Uh, constitutional realists, you see, uh, uh, of, of which I consider myself one, see foreign policy first through the lens of our constitutional duty. And second, we undertake that first task with a sober vision of the world informed by history, especially our own history. We see the answer to this tension as one that can be answered only with a measured and fact-based assessment of the national interest while respecting the clearly defined roles of both Congress and the presidency in the context of American foreign policy. This might sound natural, it might sound obvious, and yet these are the things that have been most neglected. We often neglect the constitutional question altogether, and even when neglecting the constitutional question, we don't always evaluate uh, the, the prudential question appropriately, taking into account uh, the due consideration of our history, including our recent history. So America can't uh, simply fall into the practice of ignoring the rest of the world. If ever there had been a time in the past where we could have done that, that time has long since passed us. But our engagement, uh, particularly our commitment of treasure and the precious blood of America's sons and daughters, must come only when the highest, most stringent, uh, most analytical threshold has been met and fully satisfied. And a decision of this scale should be made on the record with full acknowledgement of the stakes involved. And this decision-making, this ev evaluation, this analysis must be undertaken uh, only by individuals who are accountable to the people from the president to Congress, but especially Congress, the branch of the federal government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. There's a good reason for this. You see, Congress, the people's branch, is too often ignored or it refuses to participate in the decision-making process. And it's inevitably 
to our own detriment when this happens. The defining feature of self-government in, in any society uh, is that the, the system of self-government is supposed to involve the people always acting through their elected representatives. This is a significant feature, particularly when it comes to foreign policy and war making, a significant feature that differentiates our system from that of our predecessor government, you know, the one based in London. In our London-based national government, the one we had before we had this system, uh, one person, the chief executive, could and did make the decision to take us to war. That led to some problems. The king would say, let's go fight. It was parliament's job to figure out how to fund it. And so as a result of that, it, kings, it turns out, are, are not subject to popular will. A uh, little known fact, sad but true. Uh, a, a king could take the people to war only later uh, to lead to the people suffering. And so in Federalist 69, Alexander Hamilton acknowledged this distinction as an important one, and the one that we shouldn't forget, as something that uh, differentiated our system of government from that of our predecessor government. They wanted to be uh, in, in a country in which the decision to take us to war could be made only by the branch of government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. But our modern foreign policy has not exactly respected this tradition or this acknowledgement of this distinction this constitutional uh, separation of power, this constitutional channeling of the war-making authority to make sure that we can't go into war for light or transient reasons, nor can we or should we or must we ever go to war due the, to the decision of a single individual. You see, today, when we've drifted from this understanding to the point that a relatively small group of self-appointed experts will often anoint themselves kings and queens and make life-altering decisions for the country, more or less without any direct accountability to the people, because these tend to be people who are not elected, with the exception of the president, whom they are almost inevitably advising. Now, we'll affectionately or not so affectionately refer uh, to this group of people collectively as the blob. And the problem with the blob, other than it being inherently undemocratic, not to mention unsightly, is, is that those who comprise the blob are constantly, consistently, badly wrong. The blob told us, for example, that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that Kabul wouldn't fall. The blob also told us that sanctions would rapidly cripple Russia, that arming Syrian rebels would never benefit al-Qaeda, that we would save democracy in Libya, and that the surge that we in initiated, and then the next surge, and then the next surge, and surge after surge after surge in Afghanistan would lead to decisive and final victory. Now, sure, I get it. No one can predict the future with absolute certainty, and I don't expect perfection of anyone. I don't expect prescience or omniscience of any government, and any government or government actor who claims such abilities uh, is met with my suspicion. Sometimes the decisions that we make will be wrong. As best as we try to inform ourselves of the facts at hand, sometimes we're going to get things wrong. And I, I understand that. That's a condition of mortality, of being a human being. But when the same group of people is wrong, over and over and over again. Maybe the small room in which these decisions are made should be a little bit bigger. Maybe, just maybe at that point, we should remember the document to which every person who serves in the Senate or the House of Representatives or whoever occupies the White House has sworn an oath to uphold and protect and defend. Maybe, just maybe, the room should be bigger because the room is not on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's right here, right across the street. And it consists of two rooms the House, and the Senate. Maybe these decisions should also be subject to debate, discussion, and ultimately approval by Congress, as the Constitution requires. It's not just because the Constitution requires this that that's a good thing. The fact that they put it in there is the very reason why we need to do it. The necessities uh, will, will result in this debate and discussion. 
And this allows these ideas to be tested and defended or not defended in the light of day and where representatives can cast their votes. And then importantly, bear accountability for the outcomes rather than always being able to point to some amorphous blob on which they will cast blame to the extent blame is even cast at all. There exists exceedingly limited scenarios, specifically those involving a direct attack on the United States, wherein the commander in chief might be compelled to take immediate action. However, e even in those circumstances, the president is constitutionally prohibited from engaging in war without the approval of Congress. See, there's a difference between responding to repelling an immediate attack on the one hand and engaging in war on the other. The fact that it can be sometimes be perceived as a, as a difficult line drawing exercise doesn't mean you don't need to go through the exercise at all. It doesn't mean that the difficulty authorizes us to ignore the imperative. It's vital to recognize the difference between responding to a direct attack on the one hand and deploying American forces into undeclared wars on the other hand. But it should be the rule rather than the exception that when American blood and treasure are committed year after year after year, the people's branch should determine whether we have war or peace. In other words, given that we know that this is the ultimate outcome, uh, that the outcome when we get involved in wars, it's, it's almost never a short-term, limited-duration conflict. It requires a lot of money and a lot of blood, a lot of personnel, year after year after year. It seems to me not to be too big of a hassle to do it the right way constitutionally and the right way that results in accountability to the American people. Earlier this year when the Senate debated and ultimately passed the, the legislation dealing with the 1991 and 2002 authorizations for the use of military force, repealing both of those measures. I offered an amendment that would make future authorizations to employ military force subject to recurring approval by Congress. There are reasons I did this, reasons that have to do with our chronic neglect and decision to ignore the Constitution, and reasons that have everything to do with the fact that when the war in Afghanistan started, my daughter Eliza was an infant, just a few months old. She's now married. The fact that we can go more than two decades in a conflict without ever having Congress revisit it, to me suggested that it ought, perhaps wouldn't be a bad idea to require these things to sunset every couple of years and thereby allow for recurring accountability uh, for those who are serving in Congress at the time. The idea is to revive the sense of accountability in our foreign policy, something that's been missing for far too long. For the people we represent who have to live under these circumstances, they need to have a voice in the process, and this is the best way to do that. Now, the amendment, perhaps as uh, one might have expected, it, it failed. It failed by a vote of uh, 19 to 76. The prevailing sentiment in Washington is still that the blob calls the shots and that the options for the rest of us to fall in line, or at least not uh, to disagree with the public, uh, are uh, somewhat limited. Now, you can see the, this dynamic that I'm describing fairly clearly in the debate, or, or uh, I better said in the relative lack of debate regarding US involvement in the war in Ukraine. Debate on this question is not tolerated. And that's made clear day after day. Not, not even in the legacy media, the, the place where opinions are supposed to be debated. And the place where in decades past, anti-war sentiments had a place, not even anti-war sentiments, at least sentiments raising legitimate questions about war. None of this is tolerated, even in, especially in legacy media. I say legacy media because it seems one of the only places where you can see some discussion happening on this, and you see it in great abundance, is on social media. Um, fortunately for all, social media always has tempered non-inflammatory discussions, uh, as it's been known to nurture. Now, 
Look, I want to be very clear about something. Reasonable minds can and do disagree on whether the continued commitment of financial assistance and, and, and uh, weapons assistance is in our national interest, in the interest of the American people. But the problem I've got here is that anyone raising dissent, in fact, e even anyone raising legitimate questions is immediately labeled a Putin apologist, a lover of Russia. And I, I say that, I, I can speak with some authority here. I, I, I myself have fallen victim to that on many occasions. And more often than not, well, when I'm accused of that, it's just because I've asked some questions, questions that need to be asked, questions that haven't been answered, but should be. Defaming your opponent in a debate is not a sign of the strength of your position. It's a sign of profound weakness. We all understand this intuitively. People who, who won't debate these questions without sinking into smears and motive questioning raise, quite appropriately, more questions than they provide answers. And the United States' role in the war in Ukraine should be debated. As I've stated, my lens as a constitutional realist is twofold. Uh, assessing our national interests through the lens of prudence and the Constitution, that is what our self-government requires, what our own system requires, what we've all taken an oath to uphold anyway requires this. And the conflict in Ukraine needs to be justified on both of these metrics, but right now it is not. It's, it's not even really been attempted. Uh, first, there's the fact that our decisions to fund and arm Ukraine are not happening in a vacuum, and we've pretended in some ways as if they were. There are other emergent threats. Uh, China is engaging in a fair amount of saber rattling, more than usual, much more than usual. Our own national defense strategies in 2018 and 2020 flatly stated that the U.S. cannot engage in two major wars simultaneously. And yet we're depleting our stockpiles to support Ukraine, our stockpiles, including stockpiles of a number of things that would be needed in both arenas should that other conflict become uh, a hot one. Uh, this is leaving us ill prepared to replenish those resources and prepare for what some would say might end up being the most significant near-term threat to our national interest in our national security abroad. Second, and relatedly, we're not the only country capable of acting in the Ukraine conflict on behalf of Ukraine, in support of Ukraine, and, and against Russia. Ukraine, of course, is, is not a NATO member, but it's adjacent to a number of our NATO allies. And this, in fact, is, is often used as, as perhaps the primary justification, the primary moral imperative for why we have to do it. And, and I get it. The, the, the theory is, the theory is that if, if Ukraine were to fall, then all of a sudden you've got all these other NATO allies that we have in Europe, neighbors of Ukraine's that would end up being threatened, and that could trigger our NATO Article 5 obligations and lead to all sorts of suffering and lead to uh, a frightening empowerment of uh, the evil megalomaniac that is Vladimir Putin. So, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. Um, but we have to remember something. Our, our, our European NATO allies have for decades... Decade after decade shirked their responsibility to prioritize their own defense. Their own defense spending uh, commitments have not been met. They've been relying on U.S. security guarantees and U.S. defense spending that benefits the continent. You know, I, I think we provide roughly 70% of what's spent within NATO. We spend... Uh, something in the neighborhood of around 4% of our GDP on defense. They've got a commitment to spend 2% on theirs, and they consistently, widely fail to meet that. Think about what this means. As my, my wife puts it, it's as though we've been funding Western European, uh, or European socialism uh, through our defense spending, through NATO, for decades. And indeed, we have. You see, because we go over there 
We provide for their defense. They're sitting there, fat, dumb, unhappy. I don't mean that literally. Just, just go with me on this one. They're in the catbird seat, we'll say. They feel confident that we're there to protect them. Their big ally, the United States, is spending an enormous amount of money over there so they don't have to. So they can go and spend money on other things. They can explore uh, all the uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, reforms that they want to pursue in a way that wouldn't necessarily be possible if we weren't supplying so many of their security needs uh, through our action there. So look, I, I think it's high time that we put the burden of European security back on the shoulders of leaders in Brussels and London rather than in Washington. Until Western European capitals exceed 2% of GDP spent on defense, and I would add, uh, un until those same leaders also devote comparable shares of their GDP to this same conflict, the United States should not spend one penny more on Ukraine. This is no more our burden than it is theirs. They're making it all our burden, even though it's in their backyard, not ours. This isn't fair. Especially we, when we've been carrying this burden for them for decades. This is wrong. We all know it's wrong. But by continuing to print more money and send it over there, we're guaranteeing that they won't do it. We're guaranteeing that if and when that awful moment comes, when our NATO Article 5 obligations are triggered, we show up and we're still fighting the battle overwhelmingly. This isn't okay. And it makes us less safe. It doesn't just impoverish us. Uh, impoverish us. It, it also makes us less safe. Look, um, this burden shifting is long overdue, and it really is time for Congress to assert this reality. So as we approach the upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius, Congress must pressure the Biden administration to revise the antiquated 2008 Wales defense spending pledge. The world has changed significantly, such that 2% of GDP spent on defense, which they're not meeting, but even if they were, one could argue that it no longer reflects the exigencies of the European environment. Third, and finally, uh, our involvement in Ukraine is a proxy for our strategy toward Russia. But Russia, we have to remember, is not some trifling power. Scary, yes. Headed by a crazy mean guy, yes. But Russia, we have to remember, possesses nuclear weapons a lot of nuclear weapons. More than that, Russia does not be, uh, appear to be backing down, despite repeated insistence that if we did enough, if we spent enough over there during the early days, weeks, and months of the conflict, they would, but they don't appear to be backing down. Now, I don't think it's overstating anything to say that a standoff with a nuclear power particularly this particular nuclear power, requires a considerable amount of prudence and judgment, not peacocking and popping off. We must act like it. These are just a few of the many strategic concerns that are associated with Ukraine. Uh, we should debate them before we deliberate on sending more aid, which the Senate will do later this year, in a supplemental spending bill. And by the way, this is, this is significant here. I, I want to talk for a minute about the fact that they're planning to do this in a supplemental spending bill. That spending bill for Ukraine might well be attached to a bill to replenish the Disaster Relief Fund. Now remember, the Disaster Relief Fund is, is not there for, uh, it's, it's not like OCO. It's not the, like the Overseas uh, Contingency Operations Fund. No, this is domestic disaster relief fund. This is another sign of weakness in our uh, unflinching pro-Ukraine strategy, one that aims to send as much money as possible uh, as we possibly can to Ukraine. If your aid package cannot pass on its own merits, such that it has to be attached to another package, to a, a sympathetic, must-pass bill, a bill that will be darn near impossible 
or senators and representatives of some states uh, who either have recently been or expect soon to be um, imperiled by disasters. Uh, that says something about your cause. It says something about your failure to persuade people to support a particular cause. And so rather than smearing their ideological opponents as anti-American or pro-Putin, perhaps the proponents of Ukraine aid should spend more time actually trying to convince people, trying to persuade the American people that it's worth the sacrifice that Americans are enduring and that they will continue to ask to, to endure if we continue down this path. And you see, it's not just this one, but so many of our discussions about foreign policy happen to take on this really ugly, myopic shade. Every conflict becomes a high stakes negotiation about the future of the West. But constitutional realism demands that we see the whole field and that we try insofar as we're capable of seeing it and evaluating it dispassionately and prudently, cautiously, not always so eager to jump into a new conflict that we're unwilling and afraid to debate the merits of it with those who elected us. Like George Washington before him, John Quincy Adams was right. He was absolutely correct when he cautioned our very young nation to avoid frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. America is a little bit older now, but the sentiment is still spot on. A shrewd foreign policy is one marked by a clear-eyed and courageous assessment of America's national interest within the bound of our constitutional system of government, governance, which, which defers to the voters of the republic rather than to an elite utopian vision of the world. This is our quest. This is our obligation. This is our duty. And this is our form of government. We can restore these dynamics and restore them we must. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Lee. That was fantastic. We will have a 30-minute break now. We have box lunches set up for you by the check-in table. Please feel free, feel free to grab one of those. Be back here at 1 o'clock for our next featured address. Thank you.
the Southern Kentucky Lions Eye Clinic, an organization that provides eye exams and surgery to needy families and individuals. And he continues to perform pro bono eye surgeries for patients across Kentucky and across the globe. As a doctor, Senator Paul was trained to diagnose patients and offer solutions. And as a senator, he diagnoses our nation's problems, our ailing of constitutional liberties, dizzying fiscal irresponsibility, and the gluttony of our foreign policy establishment and he offers practical solutions. He is perhaps Congress's leading voice for foreign policy marked by realism and restraint. He's been a longtime friend of our work at the American Conservative. I believe it was 2018 when he spoke right here at our conference that year. And we are, are uh, delighted and honored to have him back here again this year. Please join me in welcoming Senator Rand Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I have uh, good news and bad news. The good news is that Congress finally voted to end a war. The bad news is the war they voted to end was already been over for about 15 years. I think it was a good idea to have the discussion. It's better than not having the discussion. We had this discussion about ending the Iraq war. Well, the Iraq war has been over for probably 15 years or so. So the vote was largely symbolic. But it shows you how disconnected the people are in Washington that even though the war has been over for 15 years, even though the war resolution specifically mentioned Saddam Hussein and his government, we still had trouble with people, a lot of Republicans in fact, but alarmed and saying, well, how could we possibly do this? And saying, what about Iran? What about Iran? One person wanted to put an amendment in there to say, but nothing in this resolution stops us from attacking Iran. It's like, this was about Iraq. This is about Saddam Hussein. If you want to go to war with Iran, have another vote. Can't we have a new vote? But the real vote, the vote of real value, if we were to discuss whether or not to continue in so many wars in so many places, would be the vote over the 9-11 proclamation. I would have voted for the 9-11 proclamation. I think we were right and justified to go after those who attacked us. But after 20 some odd years, it's used to justify war and several different continents. It's not a specific thing. I mean, people say, well, what if we repealed the 9-11? There'd be no AUMF there. Well, how could we live without an AUMF? And my response is, well, couldn't we just try the Constitution for a little while? I mean, here's the point. They think like, well, we need to have uh, the authorization. It's like, come and vote. Let's have a debate. If you want to be at war in Somalia, and you think there's a war important enough for our soldiers to be in Somalia, let's vote on it. If you think they need to be in Niger, if you think they need to be in Syria, let's vote on it. Somehow we lost this uh, conception that we would ever have a debate. But the thing is, is this is now at least a generation ago. So we have 9-11, 2001. Some people here weren't born probably then. But we, we're going to let a generation previous bind the next generation. To me, it sort of devalues the lives of our soldiers. We have many good friends in my town whose uh, their sons and daughters serve in the military. Many of my nieces and nephews have served in the military. Doesn't it devalue their lives just to say, oh, well, we authorized that back then, and it probably applies now to whatever you're being sent to do. I mean, if we're going to send young people to war and they're going to potentially give their life or their limbs up for us, shouldn't we have the courtesy to debate the war and have a real vote? And you put your name on the line that you supported the war or you didn't support the war. So it's, it's a kind of a crazy notion that we have an ongoing, eternal, eternally alive AUMF from 9-11. And I think it's something that we need to be discussed. So I put forward an amendment on it uh, to repeal the 9-11-2001 AUMF, and I got uh, nine votes. So that's the uh, contingency, I think, out there of people who believe in a constitutionally declared war or a constitutionally uh, constitutional foreign policy. The Democrats were Baldwin, Cardin, Markey, Sanders, and Warren. And then the Republicans were Braun, Lee, Vance, and myself. Uh, Braun is not going to go on to run for governor of Indiana, so we're going to lose 25% of the constitutional realists coming up. But really, that's what the debate is over. And there are some sincere people on it who sincerely believe that we should authorize war, who I think are still misguided in believing that we have to have an eternal AUMF. Tim Kaine is one. He's written about it. I think he's a sincere person, and he makes an honest debate. 
But I just don't think that having an ongoing AUMF that applies to everything is a good idea. He proposed some uh, a replacement AUMF that, in his uh, sense, in his belief, narrows it. But as we read it, we think it actually codifies war in 24 different countries because it, it is not you know specific enough to try to limit things. And so, I really think you just. We should vote. It's a pretty darn important vote. We should vote on whether we go to war. This will be an ongoing battle, and today we are introducing our End the Endless Wars resolution, and that is once again to repeal the 9-11 AUMF, and it would be repealed in six months. The reason we give them six months, I don't know why you need six months after 22 years, but we do that simply because someone will simply argue we have to have some ability to plan for the transition. So we do that trying to attract more people to the cause, but we still have difficulty. So we have nine folks. We have many who say, oh, we just don't want it attached to this. But this is a sort of the standard ploy in Washington. They always say, now, young man, that's a really good idea, but this is just not the time nor the place for that amendment. And so some of them act as if they might be for repealing 9-11, but most of them would be for repealing 9-11 only if it's replaced with another fairly open AUMF that wouldn't require us to vote to go to war with Iran or go to war with in Somalia or any other place. So I think that's a mistake, but we are continuing that fight. We just finished the debt ceiling fight, and um, to put it in perspective, because I think sometimes people got attracted to little nuggets and said, well, there's going to be a reform. Look at this reform that might happen if we pass this. Speaker McCarthy said it was the most conservative deal ever accomplished in Washington. Now, I have a hard time believing that because if you look at the big picture of it, it looks like as if we did nothing to change the trajectory of debt. Why do I say that? All of the spending that goes on, on budget, that's everything but Social Security, on budget. Two-thirds of it is mandatory spending, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and a few other items. That's the mandatory spending, two-thirds of the spending. That was taken off the table from the very beginning. So the deal that was arranged between Biden and McCarthy didn't include two-thirds of spending. And that two-thirds of spending drives the deficit. That two-thirds of spending that is mandatory spending is going up at about 5% a year. You can eliminate all of the other spending, not just freeze it, not cap it, but eliminate all other spending other than mandatory, and you don't balance the budget. You might come close to balancing the budget, but nobody's really proposing getting rid of the entire military and the entire non-military discretionary. So you take two-thirds of the spending off the table, and then you get to the one-third that's left. The one-third they call discretionary, half of that's military. Well, that was taken off as well, and military is going to get a 3% increase. So mandatory, two-thirds of spending is getting a 5% increase. That's just the trajectory it's on. Military is going to get a 3% increase. And then now we're down to half of a third. So we're down to a sixth of the budget. And even McCarthy admitted this. When they asked him about the debate, he said, uh, well, what was I supposed to do? How was I supposed to get a deal? I'm only talking about 15% of the budget. Well, it's true, but that's why the deal is of no consequence and will not change the trajectory of the accumulation of debt and isn't a conservative deal and isn't to be commended and should have been opposed because it's not going to change anything. Two thirds of the spendings off limits going up at 5%. A sixth of the spending military going up at 3%. They looked at one sixth of spending and they didn't even really cut it. They were gonna freeze it at the inflated levels that came after COVID increased it by 20%. So we've increased spending dramatically and they're just gonna keep it at an elevated level. And then they're going to increase it from there. There's nothing conservative about this. But let's say a part of you said, well, they tried really hard and this is the best they can do. And some conservatives will say that. They tried very hard, and this is the best they could get. To add insult to injury, they're already talking about breaking the caps. And my prediction is they will, they will break the even limited ineffective caps they put on within two months. In fact, they made uh, Schumer go forward. They had sort of an orchestrated public shame session. You know how in Mao's China you have to get up and apologize and you read a statement? Schumer was forced to go to the floor. This wasn't well reported, but there was a deal made, and it was under duress, between the big spending Republicans who were going to vote to raise the debt ceiling. It's the same group of people always. They came forward and said, we will vote for it, but only if you go forward after a public struggle and shaming session and say that you will break the caps as soon as you can. 
He didn't actually use those words, but that's what he meant. He came to the floor of the Senate and he said that the caps will not limit emergency spending. So you have to listen closely in Washington and watch what they're doing because what they're saying is not often what they're doing. They set caps and everybody's like, we have now have caps in spending, except for when it's emergency spending. Well, we spent $100 billion last year on Ukraine. They want to spend more money on Ukraine. I guess Ukraine needs about $50 billion every six months. So just be prepared. That's sort of the, the how fast it's being spent, and they're already clamoring for more. So you've got Ukraine spending. That's going to be an emergency, as if it's not predicted that they would run out of money. But that'll be an emergency. But if you listen to the defense hawks, they're all saying that the military spending because it's not keeping up with inflation is a real cut and we have to add to military spending. So the emergency spending is going to involve that. And then just to try to gather a few more votes, it's probably going to involve disaster spending as well. So they're going to do disaster spending, Ukraine spending and military spending, but they will break their own word. They will break their caps within a couple of months. Now to McCarthy's credit, he's saying he's not going to do it outside the appropriations process. So we'll see if that happens. Um, I know in the Senate, they're all clamoring. They're like, they, you know, they're already, you know, woe is me. We spend more than the next 10 countries combined on the military, and yet they say it's not enough. It's never enough. Well, if we had a constitutional foreign policy, it might be more than enough if we weren't doing any everything everywhere all of the time. In my caucus, if you come to my Republican caucus, you will hear the beating of drums. These are drums for war with whomever, but primarily China at this point. Everything's about war with China. I was in Hawaii recently, and I met with some folks from our military in the Pacific out there, and one of the high-ranking uh, members came up to me, and he said, take this message back to your fellow senators. War with China is not inevitable. And my goodness, shouldn't there be at least somebody in the government trying to avoid war with China, not thinking it is inevitable? We've had an uneasy peace with China. We have an uneasy relationship between the U.S., China, and Taiwan. It's uneasy because it's confusing to explain to people, but the more you explain to people, the less ambiguous it becomes. The whole idea of the, the sort of situation of the one China policy is this idea of strategic ambiguity. I was in the, my, my committee hearing today with foreign relations, and every week there's a new, new uh, bill out on Taiwan. It usually includes harsher language towards China. They want to have a war plan for what we're going to do when, when China does this and that. But my point to them is the less ambiguous you make your policy, the more you rant and rave, the more you want to make explicit your policy for war, the less ambiguous the tr and less leverage you have of something that was called strategic ambiguity. Is strategic ambiguity great? And it's not the perfect thing, but it's a, it's a thing that has kept the peace at least for 50 years, and we ought to be very careful. Some say, well, if your language isn't loud, you don't hate communism enough. I don't know anybody who hates communism more than me. I wrote a book called The Case Against Socialism. I've been the, the leading voice out here saying that in all likelihood, the pandemic started in Wuhan. I met with the representatives from the Chinese embassy the other day, and I said, why don't you help us out here? This isn't just about attacking China on this. This is about trying to protect, pre prevent the next pandemic. And they looked inscrutably at me, and uh, I don't think they're going to come forward. However, about a month later, last week, the former head of the CDC in China, a guy named George Gao, came forward and he actually mentioned that, yes, we should consider the possibility that it leaked from a lab. This is from a former high-ranking, not currently in the government, but it's difficult in China to speak the truth. The fact that he actually said that, I think, is a sign that there may be some thawing. But my point to the Chinese embassy was this. Come forward with it, not because it's a, a way to beat up on China. We have 12 to 20 of these labs here. There's labs like this all over the world doing the same kind of research. We need to discuss whether or not we should be creating viruses that don't exist in nature and that could cause a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I think that the next time could be worse. A former high-ranking member of the CDC told me privately that he believes that the next go-round could be a death rate of between 5 and 50 percent. We actually were extraordinarily lucky. Many people did die. A million Americans died from this or died with this. But the thing is, is this turns out to be a death rate of probably about 0.3 percent. 
that's a million people is about 0.3% in our country. Imagine 5% of America dying. Imagine 50%. Smallpox killed 30%. They are doing experiments where they take a virus that exists in bats and not in humans. They take part of the virus from another one that may infect humans, and they mix and match them and create new viruses. And they say, wow, I wonder if it'll infect humans. Why don't we take Ebola and see if maybe Ebola can be transmitted through the air. Wouldn't that be great? Right now, you have to transfer bodily fluids, like with HIV. It does, it's not as contagious. You don't sit around and catch HIV or Ebola for the most part. But what if we could aerosolize? Wouldn't it be great to aerosolize Ebola and just see if we could do that in a lab? That's the kind of craziness that's going on. And most of it's funded by government, so we frankly ought to regulate it. We ought to stop it. With regard to what we do moving forward and how we get better voices or more voices for constitutional restraint, I think the people are with us, frankly. When I travel around Kentucky, I'm up in the mountains and they've had a flood and they've got problems and they you know, need some of the basic functions of government to repair the flooding damage. Nobody comes up and says, I hope you can help if you have any money left over after Ukraine. We really want to support Ukraine. Nobody says that. But even if you did think Ukraine was the last best bastion of liberty and you want to support them, does it make sense to borrow money from China to send it to Ukraine? There's no fiscal sense in this. If, if, if we really think that Ukraine and the war is the last bastion for liberty, why don't we have a surtax of 100 bucks on every American and we'll pay for it? You know what? They'd all rebel because most of them really don't want this. The other thing is, is even if your best concern and your most concern is for the well-being of Ukraine, the country is getting destroyed. Give it another year, it'll be more destroyed. And what do they expect after it's destroyed? They expect us to pay to clean it up and make it a new country again. There has to ultimately be a peace. The realist point of view is this, that... If you expect unconditional surrender, you're not very realistic. If you think wars are going to end by the good defeating the evil, it's not very realistic. The end of the war in Ukraine will be a negotiated peace. I don't think the Ukrainians can completely defeat the Russians, and I don't think the Russians can completely defend, defeat the Ukrainians. My sympathies are with the Ukrainians. I, I wish they would win. The Russians are, are the uh, aggressors. And yet, if you look at it, look at the crazy nonsense that comes from people. When Nord Stream 1 and 2 were blown up, they said, well, of course the Russians did it. It's like, really? They blew up their own pipeline? They spent billions of dollars building it over a decade, and then they blew it up? That makes no sense at all. Does anybody follow the Babylon Bee? <laughs> we tweeted them yesterday, and it's a picture of Zelensky with his hands on a plunger, you know, a TNT, you know, an explosive plunger saying, you know, of course the Russians blew it up, you know, and, you know but he's got his hands on this thingy that might, you know. The disinformation that comes out about all of this, but I think the, the public is more with us than you would think. I think that if we approach this from a point of view of that we have limited resources and our primary concern is to our country, when people ask me about any other country, I tell them, look, my oath of office is to my country. I have to first make sure that my country is defended before I begin hopping around the globe and getting involved in others. And so I think if we paid more attention to the Constitution, I think we'd be better off. And I do think that the people are with us, but Washington isn't. And that's why we still need to clean house and get a new, get a new Congress as soon as possible. Thank you very much. And we've got time for a question or two. Yes. Coming over. So um, do you see progress uh, in regards to China and, and how it's handling the issue of the coronavirus now when, after you had your talks with the Chinese embassy? I don't see a lot of visible progress. Uh, the comment by their former CDC, um, George Gao, to say it's a possibility is the first breakthrough I've heard at all in any help from them. Um, the interesting thing about it, when the information that comes from them, if there are two choices, it's hard for anybody to deny the virus started in Wuhan. Almost nobody says it didn't start in Wuhan. So there's two possibilities, either a lab or uh, the, the marketplace. Which one would be worse for the Chinese? Probably that it came from a lab because it either is an accident or on purpose, but probably an accident. But the marketplace is more nature spilling over. 
Well, they investigated the Chinese and pretty much ruled out the marketplace. Nobody in China thinks it was a marketplace. They tested 80,000 animals, including animals from all over the countryside. Their incentive, if they were to be dishonest, would be to point towards the marketplace, actually. And all of their evidence, I think, as far as that goes, I think has been honest, because why would they want to point us towards the lab? Now, they don't want us to believe it's the lab either. They, they say it's like came on frozen food from a U.S. military base or something ridiculous. But... Um, is there a real thought or a change in their opinion? I don't think so, but I keep hoping there would be. I also think that there is room for diplomacy with, with China, and I think that we need more of it. My, my opinion of the State Department is nobody in the State Department really believes in, in diplomacy. It's as if they work for the Pentagon. I want a war department, but I also would like to see a diplomacy department as well. And I think we would be better off and it doesn't mean that we countenance totalitarianism, lack of speech, lack of religion. All those things exist, but it doesn't mean we should quit talking to them. I think we should high high level talk with China on nuclear arms, one on one. And I think they would talk with us one on one. They you know, weren't talking to us in a in a trilateral way with Russia because I think our insistence under the Trump administration was that uh, they would have to be you know, they would have to stay at a level at one third of our nuclear weapons. And I don't think that that's a starting point. They're going to keep growing, they think, until they have parity with us. And I don't know that we can talk them out of that. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't have conversation. Maybe one more. Anyone else? Yeah. Coming your way right here. Thank you very much. I think it's on. Thank you very much, Senator uh, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> I admired your father. Thank you. And I have a lot of respect for you, for what you have done so far, uh, questioning the validity of what has done uh, with the uh, recent fear mongering and uh, COVID, and uh, the question that you asked. Uh, Dr. Fauci. My larger question is, shouldn't these people for, who have done for the last three years so much damage to the psychic of this country and the world be more accountable for actually the crime that they have done against the public and humanity in a more serious way because uh, re resigning or retiring is not the answer. I'm a molecular biologist, immunologist, and I was in ocular inflammatory diseases at the University of Pennsylvania, and then I came to NIH. So I know a few things and I would be happy to help you if you need. I, pr uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll have somebody from my staff get your contact information. I think one of the things that came out of uh, looking into the science of COVID and looking at the how much government control has over science, the predicate was set for this with, with climate warming, with, with climate change. Because it's all funded by government, you don't get funded if you're a dissenter. So when they say there's a consensus and everybody believes this way, it's because it's all funded by one source and the people who are in the funding apparatus believe that way. It's the same way with COVID. And with COVID, they pretty much ignored basic science. So for example, it's been known since the Athenian plague in 400 BC or something that when you catch something, most of the time you have immunity to it. Not perfect, but most of the time, you, if you get it the second time, it's not as bad as the first time because you've developed immunity. In fact, that is the principle upon which vaccines are developed. But they came to believe that, well, the vaccines were great, but if you were affected, we don't care what your immunity is. But if you really wanted to sort this out and you wanted to do studies, studies of the public to see what works, does your vaccine work? If you don't ask the person if they've already been infected or do antibody tests to see if they've already been infected, your study is meaningless. If you do not have a wing for vaccinated, unvaccinated, and also previously infected but not vaccinated, previously infected and vaccinated, if you don't have that in your wing of things. And it got it to the point where on the internet there are just 
amazing doctors out there just really going through this in a thorough fashion, but none of them are on mainstream TV. None of them, some of them are kicked out of their societies. Uh, Vinay Prasad is really good on this stuff. Um, Martin Koldor, Jay Bhattacharya, there's a whole group of people that are really good on this, but there is also a consensus. And after 40 years of Fauci being in the same place, everybody there has been appointed by him over decades and decades, and they're of one mind. But this is incredibly important that we continue to go after, and I will, because I do worry that the next accident could be much worse. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Senator Paul. That was fantastic. We're going to roll right into our next conversation on toward a realist American grand strategy. Uh, that line might look somewhat familiar for all of you because if you came, if as you came in this morning, you picked up a printout of the article of the same name, you'll have a little bit of a primer on what our discussion here is going to be about. That was written by Representative Warren Davidson, who's joining us here today, along with Representative Anna Paulina Luna and the American Conservative. So I'll introduce our uh, two speakers here, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague. First off, Representative Warren, Warren Davidson, as I, met, as I mentioned, uh, represents Ohio's 8th Congressional District. Before he was elected to Congress in 2016, Representative Davidson served in the U.S. Army and was stationed in Germany with the 3rd Infantry Division when the Berlin Wall came down. He then went to West Point and graduated near the top of his class as a student of American history and mechanical engineering. As an officer, he led the Old Guard, the 75th Ranger Regiment, and the 101st Airborne Division. And joining Representative Davidson will be our, my colleague, our own Samantha Maitra. He's a senior editor with the American Conservative. Before that, he came to us from the Center for the National Interest. I'll hand it over to Samantha now. Thank you, Emil. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. My voice booms anyway. Um, it's interesting to talk about war and peace and realism in a, in a town covered with smog and low visibility, but enough about Mordor. Um, <laughs> I'd, uh, Congressman Davidson, thank you for being here. I'd um, head straight to the basic questions that you wrote about in this article that everyone can find in the registration table outside. So you have been interested about American interests in Europe. Um, I, I just want to start with the basic question. What are the American interests in Europe? And are they the same as how they used to be doing NATO when NATO was first formed? Yeah, so, you know, NATO was formed really to lock in America's uh, power at the end of World War II. Um, if you look at uh, America's interest, go all the way back to World War I, it was controversial to create a draft at the time to participate in World War I. Uh, what, what was America's interest at the, in World War I? Good question. Um, obviously, a lot of American ancestry goes back to Europe, so people felt an affinity. But because of that, it was it was touchy to say which side could we get on board with because, you know, a lot of Americans had Germanic ancestry and not just French or English ancestry. And and, and then so World War II, we were reluctant uh, to get involved. Right. So uh, it took it took uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor to get America to the point where, all right, we should actually do more than just sell weapons. Uh, and, and so we got into the war. The last time the planet had as much debt as we have right now, uh, following on to Senator Paul's comments, was at the end of World War II. We had the Treaty of Bretton Woods. We literally reset the entire global monetary system. Uh, and the good thing is we knew that we actually had to pay down the debt. Right now we have that much debt, and the fight isn't even about paying it down. It's, it's not even about servicing the interest. Uh, there's not really a coherent plan. And how did, we, how did we lose this? Well, I think really in the process of that transition of fighting and really winning World War II and certainly winning uh, the shape of what would occur at the end of World War II, uh, we, we kind of succumbed to the temptation. So you mentioned the reference to Mordor, of course, Lord of the Rings. You know, this, this power, um, you know, changes people. And I think the one ring to rule them all is money, right? It is the coercive nature of money. 
And, you know, we created, uh, you know, the became the world's reserve currency at the end of that. And so that's that basically created the, the framework for empire. And you know, I think one of the best book titles recently in the real politics space was, and I say recently, it was in the late 90s, uh, Pat Buchanan's book, A Republic, Not an Empire. So that's not an endorsement for everything that he writes about in the book or for him. But I just think the title really sums up what happened is at the end of World War II, uh, America started working to build an empire instead of preserving our republic. And, and while there was a consensus at the end of that that led to us paying down the debt, uh, you know, by 1971, uh, we were now shifted into empire uh, management. Right. You know, and we, we've gone up in terms of our debt. Uh, and if you look, one of the most important sites is WTF happened in 1971.com. The WTF happened in 1971.com. On August 15th in 1971, the United States broke the gold standard that was implemented at, at Bretton Woods. And, you know, we, we kind of preserved the world's reserve currency by creating the, quote, petrodollar. All commodities are still going to be settled there. And so we're still in this scramble to preserve empire. So the real question is, can you get behind a empire preservation strategy? Well, then in that sense, yeah, we have had an interest in Europe. Uh, because if Europe shifts to uh, a hegemony dominated by uh, China and Russia, and uh, the payment system globally shifts, and we won't really be able to use the money as a way to coerce and control the system in the world. And uh, if we keep them in our orbit, we can kind of preserve ours. And I think the real path is to just restore our republic and get a government small enough to fit back into our constitution. Um, could we do that and still maintain the NATO guarantees? You know, maybe, but as you start lap looking out, NATO itself is a defensive alliance, right? And um, I think a lot of people have been sold, a lot of Europeans have been sold the I idea that joining NATO is really just buying war insurance and America will fight your wars for you. Uh, and, and what we're seeing in Ukraine is if America won't actually fight the war for you, they'll at least fund the war for you. And so we're, we're cutting a lot of checks to fight a po proxy war. And the common denominator is we're not actually defining what our interest is. We're not declaring a, a, a defining a mission. And when you don't define a mission, then you can't hold anyone accountable for success or failure, but you can keep funding endless wars. And I think Eisenhower was a person that that really saw the risk of what was about to unfold, that we would potentially be pulled into this uh, period of creating an empire uh, and abandoning the republic. And, you know, he never got accused of being an isolationist because, I mean, he's General Eisenhower, uh, but he spent way less on the military. He focused on it. He cautioned against the military industrial complex. And he frankly, he also cautioned against the scientific technical elite, which, you know, Anthony Fauci is the epitome of that. So the two big wings that he saw as a threat to the republic, um, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to say, have not turned out to be a pretty big threat to the republic. Congressman, I'm glad you mentioned about the scientific technological elite about Eisenhower, because one of the key questions is the nature of bureaucracy, and that's on autopilot. Michael Anton this morning was talking about the nature of bureaucracy, and that kind of like goes on its own. Is there any way to reform the NATO bureaucracy? Because essentially, we are the largest contributor, and they are the ones who are getting money, and they're commenting on domestic affairs of different countries and constituents, and they're talking about disinformation, like the rule of expertise. So a policy question would be how to reform that. Like, what would be your opinion on how to reform the current structure? Yeah, good question. We actually voted on this earlier in the year, and I was one of a I think about a dozen people that voted no, uh, and and why? Because the the bill was crafted and messaged as a a, a resolution of support for NATO. No, that's not what it was. If you read the bill, it was support for a new strategic purpose for NATO. We don't need a st new strategic purpose. They don't even do what they do now, right? right? And it follows on. If you look at the timeline of what um, 
you know, just the short version is a long, you know, centuries old version of how there came to be war between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, there's a lot of history there. But if you just go back, America ended the Afghan war on August 31st of 2021. And on September 1st of 2021, America entered into a strategic partnership agreement with Ukraine to support their membership in the European Union and NATO. On, September, on February 22nd of 2022, um, Jens Stoltenberg, the leader for NATO, Secretary General for NATO, um, gave a speech where he talked about the ability of NATO to project power around the world. That's the new strategic purpose that they want to talk about, is the ability for NATO to turn into some kind of power projection platform. It's a defensive alliance. Where would they need to project power? You know? That's a complete opposite. And two days later, that's when Vladimir Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. Now, that doesn't excuse his invasion or anything else. Uh, but there are reasons why, you know, the Russians are particularly concerned about the expansion of NATO. What has grown is NATO, not... Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the redefinition of NATO, to get to your question, how do we, how do, we do what they are already trying to do? They are, they are, in fact, already trying to do what you said, redefine NATO. And, and they're also using NATO uh, as a, a tool uh, of the European Union uh, because they put in uh, these strategic centers to focus on disinformation, right? Well, they, they want to essentially engage in influence operations to coerce uh, governments to comply with the European Union. And what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about countries like Poland, and Hungary, who want to um, have more conservative social policies, pro-family policies, um, and and so the administration, the current one, um, rewards countries like that with uh, openly homosexual uh, ambassadors who are there flying pride and trans flags, and that's the number one foreign policy objective for Hungary, apparently, from the administration. Right. Not like you know, building our actual relationship with Hungary, but actually just like the European Union driving a wedge between, you know, the values of that country and our own. And, and so that is a tool for projecting, you know, not, a, not really America's principles, but certainly the current administration's principles. And NATO is being co-opted to be a participant in this um, process. So how do we do that? Well, we have to get leadership that it says we're not going to fund uh, anything other than a narrow interest in NATO. And as a condition of us funding anything related to NATO, you have to comply with the treaty. You have to fund your own defense, and you have to be willing to participate in your own defense. And we should be very clear in our um, commitments that if we are to remain part of NATO, uh, we're only going to help you win a war. We're not going to fight your war for you, um, period. So uh, the, the thing that you mentioned about um, the Eastern Europeans, Hungary and Poland, and their interests are differed from the rest of the core Europe in, in the West. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is like not many countries in NATO are paying their 2% share of, of defense that they're supposed to do. Now, there is an argument that because of the expansion of NATO, because of the frontiers of the Western countries moving to the east, these countries do not face any kind of threat that they're supposed to face. And because Americans, and to some extent the Brits, are positioned in the Eastern Europe, they don't feel the threat, to, threat enough to pay for their own defense. So the question is two-part. One, is NATO expansion and European expansion a flaw and... Is America suffering from the success of the 90s in a way? And if so, is there a way to divide the countries to make sure that they pay for their own shares? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the biggest problems, and I mean, it's a big part of why I decided to not stay in the military, uh, is we didn't really know what we were going to do after we succeeded in the Cold War, right? We had all this power, and we didn't know what to do with it. Well, China knew what to do with it. I mean, they certainly made um, a, a lot of use of the end of the Cold War and have clearly advanced China's interests. Um, and America has only, not only not advanced our interests, we're, at, we're actively helping China and others advance theirs. That doesn't mean that we should be on a war footing with China. 
uh, but we should actually be reoriented on our policy. So, you know, the, the, the groups that most like a long war in Ukraine uh, are Russia. As long as there's a war going on, Ukraine's not going to be part of NATO. I mean, Lindsey Graham would like them to be, you know, this week, but um, they're not going to be part of NATO as long as there's active war there. Because the other NATO countries would feel like, whoa, that'll pull us into the war too. Uh, so even if America got to that point, I think a lot of the other countries would be like, whoa, 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 we don't really want to go to war with Russia. Um, and then China is pretty content for there to be a long war in Russia too, because uh, they, they certainly appreciated that for this century, we've largely been focused in the war on terror. And, you know, we were using all the resources uh, to go to Central Command to fight you know, jihad folks in the Middle East uh, using the most advanced weaponry in the world to take out pickup trucks with machine guns on the back of them, right? And uh, China is like, great, we're going to build the biggest navy in the world. We're going to, uh, you know, work on ways to defeat your aircraft carriers. We're going to use space to be able to take out AWACS and everything else. And uh, meanwhile, uh, America's military still can't get the F-35 supplied with reliable um components. China's worked to infiltrate those supply chains. So um, China is certainly appreciative of that. And, you know, there are people within China who are hardliners. I think Xi Jinping is one of those. He's a radical departure from Hu Jintao, which is why you saw Hu Jintao perp walked out of the last People's Congress in China. Uh, very radical departure. You know, Xi Jinping is essentially a, a Maoist authoritarian. Um, you know, not necessarily a Marxist per se, Chinese, uh, communism with Chinese principles, which capital grows, grows things and creates wealth. But he's got a very different view on that than, you know, what was underway prior to his, t his tenure. So I think we should be reorienting that way. And I think one of the mistakes that if we completely abandon NATO without taking that context into consideration, um, China would be very happy to come into Europe and say, We'll be happy to keep you right. safe from who, I don't know. But they've done it. We used to have the Monroe Doctrine, right? We used to take a particular interest in the Western Hemisphere all over South America, all over Central America, even with Canada. China's built very deep ties, right? And, and that, that is undermining what has historically been part of the realpolitik security approach to the United States. Um, I think the opportunity is to work in NATO to do really – a broader view that isn't just militaristic, but is, is more holistic. And when you think about trade, one of the mistakes of the 90s, I mean, Bill Clinton spent all of the 90s working to create the World Trade Organization and structure it in a way that has highly favored China. They get treated as a developing nation, a developing economy, but they pledged as part of that to be a market economy. And of course, they're not a market economy, they're a command economy. They weaponized their, I mean, they literally used their entire intelligence service to target intellectual property. Uh, they steal intellectual property. They shape market access. Um, they buy up companies in the United States and everywhere else. They don't just do these things to the United States. They do that to everyone. And essentially, it's exactly how they took over Hong Kong without firing a shot. It's how they're so far um, insulated. They, they could do mili military attack against Taiwan but they're working to do it without a military attack prior to Xi Jinping. And I do think Xi Jinping wants to do something military just to be seen as the alpha and not just be uh, viewed as powerful, but be viewed as the most powerful in on his own terms, on China's terms. So I think that's real. The question is, is that, is that something we should take the bait on? Uh, and, and I don't think so. I think we should work with a, with a different end in mind. But I think the, put that context in, and if, if we could, every uh, military academy in the world, I assume the ones in China as well, will tell you you're more likely to win a war if you multiply your allies than if you multiply your enemies. And part of the problem with the approach we did on trade was, wasn't that it wasn't in our rational self-interest, it was we went to war with everyone all at once, yeah. right? And the reality is we should have been dealing with everyone to confront China's trade practices, because China's really breaking the spirit, uh, and in fact the terms, of the World Trade Organization, the rules-based order that Blinken alludes to. 
and to the extent there is a vestige of, you know, principled American uh, history, you know, uh, the business of America's business, right? We've been a trading country since we were colonies. Um, and, and so how do you get back focused on free trade? Well, you have to make it actually free. There is no such thing as free trade with China. So if we don't deal with that, we aren't going to have uh, this kind of, uh, you know, more civil liberties oriented culture that I think a lot of people hope for. Um, and, and that's ultimately why the, the anarchists always fail. Someone else uses power against them because they, they, f they find them ill-prepared to defend themselves. So we have to get back to where we are truly secure as a country, and that's what we, that's what we have. We have a republic if we can keep it. So the next question, obviously, is uh, <clears throat> how do we... So a lot of people know about the theory, uh, but they don't really understand the processes that goes on. Um, and one of the major problem with that is the like the last, you know, in Trump administration, his views were not pushed through because of there were like various uh, elements within the institutions, whether it's media or an outside bureaucracy. Is there a way to um, reform those lobby groups or media or Pentagon? Um, what, what would you say? Because uh, from your former experience as an army man. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, the, one of the best phrases out of uh, the Trump era was drain the swamp, right? Uh, I think everyone realizes there's there's some sort of embedded bureaucracy that finds themselves, um, you know, eventually viewing themselves as the true protectors of the country. And, you know, the politicians are just going to be politicians. We're the real heroes. We're going to protect. We're going to protect the country. No one epitomizes that more than Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alexander Venman. Right. Uh, or dirtbag, as I refer to him. All right. So this guy felt like he, like the president, he literally said in a hearing that the president has a role in foreign policy. But it's really, you know, lieutenant colonels like him who are the real heroes there to protect us, right? To spy on the president's phone call and to try to use the fact that he was, you know, going to actually ask a rational question. Are you guys going to look into the corruption over here uh, as as a grounds to impeach him? So you know this is the this is the kind of we, we truly have built a police state. The good news is so far uh, it hasn't truly been it, well. It has been weaponized. It's not really like what we think of as a true authoritarian controlled police state. But a lot of the cautions that people um, you know shared with the passage of the Patriot Act and the response to 9-11 um, were, you know, this is going to be abused. Don't, don't be foolish and trade, uh, you know, liberty for security, uh, particularly uh, in, in a way that's unaccountable. Since 2005, um, we have not had an appropriations bill that passed. Well, in 2005, that's when Homeland Security was created as a department. That's when the uh, director of national intelligence was put in place. That's when kind of the culmination of some of the things that came out of the Patriot Act happened and the uh, reorganization happened in the intelligence community. So how could they get away with some of the things that, you know, are at least cited in the Durham report or kind of public knowledge, things that the abuses that they've engaged in? And I think those are the tip of the iceberg, things that Edward Snowden has shared Lots of things that have become um, public knowledge since those days, and frankly, even more that are classified, right? There, there are a lot of abuses. Uh, and how do they do that? Well, because they've not been held accountable. And the key to doing that is the appropriations process. So um, that's where, like, the, the win of, uh, the, kind of the stealth win of the last debt limit bill, and I, I won't say the overall debt limit was... Uh, a win. It was uh, has all the shortcomings Senator Paul was highlighting, but to the extent there is a win, uh, one of them is it. It is designed to push uh, towards real appropriations. If you don't get all twelve appropriations bills done, um, then there's a one percent cut uh, locked into a continuing resolution. So it's a, essentially the penny plan, uh, not a full robust version, but it 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 does put downward pressure on it. 
And for the defense industry, uh, you know, the defense budget, it would actually go down by 4% because they were promised a 3% increase. And normally that's how Republicans have been rolled on spending is the defense hawks cut a deal with the progressives and say, all right, well, as long as we get a dollar for defense, you can have a dollar for these programs. That sort of uh, deal with the devil got broken in this last debt ceiling fight. So we are highly motivating it by breaking the link between non-defense and defense. We are highly motivating it by um, the 99% CR. And then we have to get the real appropriations across the finish line. And if we don't put the terms and conditions in, shame on us. I mean, you know, Elon Musk basically bought a t crime scene with Twitter. And, you know, what are we going to do about it? I mean, the good thing is, you know, Speaker McCarthy and with input from all, all of our colleagues agree, we should create a committee on weaponization of the government. This is really, we have a committee focusing on this. And so that, that should really give people some hope that we are going to start to drain the swamp in this respect. We have to take the things we learn from that and get them implemented in law through the appropriations process. And the best success that I could think that we would get is consequences if you don't do it. And they're not the most grievous consequences, but it's a real step in the right direction to say there will be some. I, I wanted to ask one more question before I throw it to the audience. Uh, you mentioned that you were in CNN uh, this morning talking about the, the debt ceiling bill anyway. Um, one of the things that happened, or they're trying to do at least, is to keep acquisitions for Ukraine separate from, from, the, from the bill that passed. So if that happens, is there any way to stop further Ukraine aid from happening because it's already crossed 115 billion? Well, the, my account. Yeah, so yeah, and, and, it, and if, if you put a tax on every single American, I think that works out to be like 350 bucks a person. So if you really want to help Ukraine, you're already in for 350. Can we count on you for another 350? Everyone? Uh, and since the kids can't have the money, you're going to pitch in for the kids too, right? All right. Uh, so, you know, it'll be a little bigger. So I think if you look at it in those terms, does, how much does America really support the thing? And we might, but we've never defined a mission. So you go back, historically, post-Vietnam, we have supposedly learned our lesson, and you don't get into a war unless you define a mission. Um, and then, you know, the, the ideal is you also have a plan for an exit strategy. How do you get out of this war? And those questions haven't been answered. So, you know, I think there are like 10 of us that never voted for any, any uh, not a dime for Ukraine. Uh, and that's my basic criteria. Like, well, you've never defined a mission. You've never defined what success looks like. Uh, and, and, oh, help Ukraine. Well, you try seeing that as the mission at the infantry officer basic course. Uh, you will fail. Right? You have to actually have a real mission. Uh, and the range over there is anything from make sure the war doesn't spread to NATO countries, to no Russians in Ukraine, to no Russians in Ukraine, including the Crimea boundaries. Uh, to regime change. Victoria Newland would say we need regime change in Russia and war crimes tribunals, including for Vladimir Putin. Well, that's a whole different range of war, and every one of those has a radically different budget in terms of what it would take to succeed in accomplishing those missions. And that's why they avoid the conversation, because then there would actually be accountability for, well, I don't know, how many resources do we need? So they want to slow drip it, which is what we've done so far, this century with the war on terror, you know, they just keep cutting the checks. Um, and you'll have the same results. You won't actually accomplish the mission uh, and because it's designed not to actually result in success. Senator Warner uh, recently did an interview where he shared how he thinks it's successful is we're grinding down the Russian army. Well, that's not a just war. That's not even a moral war. You're literally grinding down the Ukrainian population uh, for a mission that isn't even designed to result in victory, right? It, it's just designed to grind down the Russian army. Uh, it's not going to give the Ukrainian people their country back. It's not going to give the people their lives back. It's certainly not going to, you know, so how's that make America more secure? Uh, no one is answering it, but it will, the defense contractors do like it. I've got a, a, someone who reached out to me that said, yeah, our, com our company actually made their main effort no longer focusing on U.S. sales, they're focusing on Eastern European sales um, for the next five years. 
Is there any, just playing the devil's advocate for a very short moment, is there any justification of testing new weapon systems there? Because that's what, you know, you, Look, you read research from Atlantic Council, they're probably going to say, you know, we are trying new weapons there. Is that, is that justified? I, I can't see that as a just war, but yes, yeah, certainly we try all kinds of things uh, whenever there's a war. And, you know, the proving grounds are helpful, but the battlefield uh, is the best way to test anything. And when you can test it on someone else's soil, it's better than testing it on your own. That's right. um, it's not really moral, though. I, I think it's not a just war if you don't have if, if, if you don't have a way to achieve something that couldn't be achieved without war. How's it just? I mean, you know, you could have avoided this war up front with better diplomacy. Um, I, in my view, they worked to create the war, which is inherently unjust. Uh, but you could have prevented this war. And diplomatically, I think you could resolve this war. I don't know about in 24 hours, but I do think you could resolve this war, you know, diplomatically. Um, so it will be a negotiated peace. It will not be a total victory uh, because the world is not willing to commit the kind of resources that it would take for a total victory over Russia, I think, at least yet. You know, maybe they'll do something that cements the resolve or be blamed for doing something that cements the resolve, right? Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the challenge. So for it to be a just war, you would have to be able to achieve something with war that you would not be able to be achieved with diplomacy. And I think that's the real under-resourced thing. When you look at the swamp, the State Department has got to be, you know, I, I don't know, one of the least effective agencies. Uh, they've been just as unsuccessful as the war on poverty, right? So um, with respect to what would it take to get more, I'm encouraged because Speaker McCarthy said uh, he agrees. We just passed a CAPS bill. We don't have plans to break the CAPS. Right. And so far, that's really encouraging for me and, and for even people who oppose the bill because they, they were, I think, at least heartened to see that the senators uh, who want to spend more, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, had angst because they believe the cuts are real, the CAPS are real, and they're going to have to find a way to get around them. And in the Budget Control Act of 2011, they did find a way around them. They created something called OCO, or the Overseas Contingency Operations. That's exactly what um, Lindsey Graham is trying to create, is something that works outside the caps. And then they, they didn't score it for a Congressional Budget Office scores. They, they exempted it and pretended they weren't spending the money for it. And that's the thing that they want to recreate. And we can't let that happen. And I think Speaker McCarthy knows that he can't let that happen. We have time for one single question um, to the gentleman there. Does anyone have a... Yeah, you can ask your question, actually. Yeah. No, you, we, can, we can hear you. I mean, I'm encouraged that um, that uh, the same group of countries that uh, want to defend Europe also feel some some uh, hope for defending Japan and South Korea. I mean, the reality is the Korean Peninsula to me is like the best place on the world to see the difference that the United States can make. Um, you know, but for the United States getting involved in the Korean Peninsula in 1950 to 53 the whole peninsula would be overrun and be like North Korea, you know? Um, and and uh, frankly, but for China's involvement, supporting North Korea, uh, we could have made the entire Korean peninsula, you know, first world country like South Korea, you know, first world businesses, first world healthcare, you know, free and open society to a far greater extent. Um, and so that all came to a truce at the, 38th parallel there. And I think that's really where the clash of ideas is. It's really goes back to that time frame. And we hope that we can resolve it with diplomacy. And, and as I was alluding to, I think the State Department um, may not be up to the task. Uh, and, and in the worst case scenario, as 
Senator Paul was mentioning in his talks, uh, there's a pretty big drumbeat towards towards war. We've got people that want a, a true declaration of war um, preemptively to defend Taiwan. I don't think the American people want to go to war with Taiwan, but they certainly don't want the entire NATO alliance to be involved. And right now, um, if you look at the Ukraine war, that would inherently be more unequal. So if you think like, you know, Germany feels less inclined to spend money because they've got these Eastern European buffer countries um, between themselves and, and Russia, how much uh, less resolve would they have to do something in, to help Japan or South Korea? And uh, France has essentially already realized where this is going, and they're like, mm, I think we could get along fine with China. They don't have, have any plans whatsoever to participate in anything confronting China. And, you know, I think more troubling, although the UK has a, a, a little bit of a division in their uh, governance structure like we do, um, you know, one of their former foreign ministers recently said the same. It's not in the UK interest to engage in any kind of confrontation with China. Right now, they all want to do business with China, and they're willing to completely ignore threats to security. There's only really one threat to uh, peace in in, in uh, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and it's China, right? So um, does that mean that we have to go to war against China? No, but I don't think it means that we should be gearing up NATO to be some sort of power projection force into the Pacific. Please join me in applauding Congressman Davidson. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sumatra. Thank you, Congressman, um, for that excellent discussion. Uh, we're going to move now to, to our congressional plenary speeches, uh, starting with one from Representative Dan Bishop. Congressman Bishop has emerged as one of the most exciting uh, new conservative voices in Congress. He represents North Carolina's 8th Congressional District. And before coming to Congress, Congressman Bishop served in North Carolina's General Assembly and took on some of the hardest fights that state faced uh, such as the fight over the transgender bathroom issue. Since coming to Congress in 2019, Con Congressman Bishop continues picking the tough but righteous battles on the national level, pushing for foreign policy, realism, and restraint, while the Uniparty continues to beat the drums of war. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Dan Bishop. Thanks, Emil. Good to be with you. Uh, it's been kind of an active two weeks up here. I don't know if you guys are following ongoing uh, efforts over in the House, but we've been busy having constructive conflict, and, um, and we're still working on that, but I've got my focus sort of distracted. I was thinking about what I might say to you here today, and um, uh, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've uh, Warren, a good friend Warren, uh, a great expert on the issues he was discussing, and my housemate, uh, among other things, but a great thinker. You know, one thing that is true I found in Washington in the, in the four years I've been here is that there's there's lots of sophistication in Washington. Uh, there, there, there are experts everywhere you look. Um, and yet the results are often seem to fall short of the product that expertise, genuine expertise would provide. I'm a, I'm a strong fan of the power of common sense. I think the test of the validity of any philosophical or theoretical system is its predictive power. Uh, you know, can it applied across time predict outcomes in a way that lets you know that your thinking about inputs is correct? Um, and so as we're poised for spending decisions in this Congress, we've been through our uh, debt ceiling thing. We have the resolution of the speaker's contest in January with the principles that are required. We have the appropriations process at hand. We have, as Warren just mentioned, uh, people talking about limits to spending, but uh, folks want, already want to do supplementals to continue feeding the war effort in Ukraine just as it's been done so far. 
how can smart people constantly be so wrong? And, and what do we do about that? How do we think about that? And I thought for this, it gets just as a common sense guy, and all you guys are probably in touch with the details on this even more than I am, but just a trip down memory lane since the inception of the Ukraine conflict in February of last year. Putin is Hitler. He's bent on the invasion of Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, even Norway. Not only was that his intent, but it was imminent, we were told. It required an unlimited commitment by the United States to do everything that it took to support Ukraine as long as it took. But in fact, as history unraveled, he, he bogged down in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, and he's never advanced beyond that. You have this constant tension in the stories. You remember the 40-mile-long uh, string of tanks that were ripe to be destroyed on the field? And the constant stories of <clears throat> command incompetence? Seems to be a conflict. Didn't predict well the full unfolding events. And now Russia is bogged down east, well east of the Dnieper River. Um, and we hear these stories continuing endlessly of, of command incompetence. The policy approach of pouring a torrent of military resources into Ukraine <clears throat> with the expectation of destroying the Russian, Russian military, forcing a complete withdrawal from Ukrainian territory. And as Warren also just mentioned, there are those who are whispering the thoughts of regime change in Russia. That was the plan, right? And it was to happen fast in February of last year. But again, we haven't seen anything like that turn of events. And every time that it falls short of occurring, the rhetoric we hear from those in that general school of thought is we just haven't applied enough resources. We need to give, it, it needed to do the tanks faster. We need to do F-16s faster. Um, the non-falsifiable theory. So rather than having the Russians thrown out of Ukraine by the resolve of the West and maybe regime change in Russia, 15 months in, we have the term tossed around more and more frequently, frozen conflict. We heard that the Ukrainian military was mythic almost in its courage and, its, and the capacity of its leadership that Zelensky was Churchillian. And yet, as the events have rolled along, we see striking things. New York Times forced to run an article the other day about the inexplicable and disturbing, I believe they used the term disturbing presence of Nazi uh, iconography and, and uh, references repeatedly occurring in, in, uh, in major Ukrainian force components. We see a story emerging in the Washington Post that it was Ukraine who was planning to destroy, to sabotage the uh, Nord Stream pipelines. You know, first there was Russia that was doing that. New story that emerges, of course, now Russia being accused of destroying the dam uh, in, in uh, territory occupied by the Russian army. How will that turn out? Will it follow the same pattern that we've seen? And how is this consistent with a fighting force in, in Ukraine that can be depended upon to defeat the Russians soundly, and yet we haven't seen that develop either? So we've sent... The United States has sent $110 billion spent on, that conduct, on, the, on the conduct of that effort in Ukraine. And we are now, at 15 months in, still expectant about a counteroffensive. Remember that last fall we saw, according to media reports, 
it, material advances by Ukrainian forces retaking territory from Russia. That lasted for a while, and then we were told we were going to wait for a spring offensive, a spring offensive supported by Western munitions and supplies. June on my calendar is not the spring. And even now, what we see is more terminology emerging, almost parroted by media outlet after media outlet. They're shaping operations. The first stages, we're under, we understand, of a counteroffensive. And yet, we also see the entry into Bakhmut. Uh, Ukrainian forces, as the news has emerged, uh, a meat grinder for Ukrainian forces. So we see immense suffering by uh, Ukrainian population, immense losses by Ukrainian military personnel, perhaps grinding down the Russian military, and perhaps that has utility for the United States, but always these ideas seem to be bound up in, in, in theories that have little predictive power. How long was, must we go before the joy that Lindsey Graham expresses in killing Russians, best money we've ever spent, I believe was the quote, how long can, can we go while that notion can continue to be expressed by an American policymaker? I hope not long. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't need to be a student of theory, uh, con convicted about a rules-based order, a globalist, a realist. If you apply tests of common sense, the effort that's been undertaken in the name of American foreign policy is not bearing the results that we've been promised from day one. And at each step, what American policymakers, American, what, what, what advocates of the neocon point of view in Congress want to do is to double down. I was in a private meeting with one of the most influential uh, on that score within the last 30 days who explained that all of what we need to do in the United States is to project military power abroad because we want to fight people there rather than fight them here. But that that's expensive. I can't argue with the premises. We want to have a strong military. We want to have a presence in the world that is reflective of American strength. But their ideas are not working. It isn't working out for the Ukrainians. It isn't working out for the American people and the difficulty we have increasing difficulty of affording the costs of the policy that's engaged in, the debt that we continue to accrue that poses risk of disaster for our children and our, and our grandchildren. It is not bearing out for world geopolitics where Russia is compelled to be the junior partner, not a, not a, uh, uh, another strategic power vying with China, but a junior partner with China. And China dominating the relationship begins to spread its um, apparatus into through Pakistan and into Iran as a principal weapons supplier. And the Middle East begins to realign. The BRIC countries consider how their currencies what currency to trade in. Their ideas are not working. That's the problem. And common sense dictates the answer to that. If your ideas are not working, if every one of your predictions fails to, become, to come true, how can it be the right answer to continue to do the same thing or more to double down and do more of the same thing? I submit, ladies and gentlemen, that just doesn't pass the test of common sense. And that's why it is critical 
that those of us who represent the American people, who are a people of common sense, in this Congress, cannot accept the uniparty approach to doing the same thing in the same way or doing even more of the same thing. The only way that will change is if we enter into constructive conflict. We can't have more deals like the debt ceiling deal that we just inked, where we capitulated, Republicans capitulated to the policy priorities of the Biden administration and left the debt on track to accrue $4 trillion more or more in the next year and a half. We simply cannot do it. So in the House, our challenge right now, and I and Warren commented on this as well, and I'm pleased to see it as well, but we'll see it needs to, we need to follow through. The Speaker has, if you will, doubled down on his recent rhetoric that there are no more blank checks, that he's not prepared to see supplementals breaking the caps that he's just agreed to. That's where we are, ladies and gentlemen. I said to you, to the, to the American conservative at your anniversary dinner some months ago that what is most needed here is not more experts, uh, not more of the people that Warren described and the, um, who, who believe that they are the stewards of American good fortune and they reside in the think tanks and in the bureaucracies and in the committee staffs in Washington. It is the American people whose common sense must be reasserted. And there is no greater illustration of how important and imperative it is that it be reasserted than the last 15 months in Ukraine. The fact is that the globalists, the advocates of the rules-based order, and those who believe we hitch the United States fiscal wagon to that and spend until kingdom come, They have great aspiration on their side. They want the result to be one that we can be proud of and that will be effective and that would be better for the flourishing of mankind everywhere. But they're simply not correct. They cannot predict the outcome of their policy in a world that isn't cooperating with them. And it falls to those of us who are prepared to, through the assertion of will, make a change. And this Congress will tell the ta will, is, is going to tell the tale. This Congress, where we're divided in power, but where we are, with that narrow majority in the House, having some of the most consequential conversations and deliberations I think have occurred in, here, here in the last 25 years. And it is not an easy path. Uh, but I am convinced that common sense will prevail. And, uh, and we'll see this thing turn in a direction that, that makes sense for the American people. God bless you all. Glad to be with you. All right. Thank you, Congressman Bishop. We're going to keep rolling now. I believe we have uh, Congressman Good set and ready to go, who I will introduce here in just one second. All right. Um, so Congressman uh, Bob Good represents Virginia's 5th Congressional District. I, I believe I mentioned this the last time I had the honor of uh, introducing Congressman Good as well. That's one of the most beautiful parts of my home state of Virginia. So if you ever get the chance to go down to Nelson County in the 5th District, I, I encourage you to do so. I'm quickly becoming a, uh, a great tourism advocate for the 5th District as well here. Um, Representative Good has represented that district since January of 2021. And he uh, is a fierce advocate for the foundational principles that have and will continue to make America the greatest nation in history, which in the realm of foreign policy, as we've heard earlier today, and as George Washington's farewell address makes clear, is one of realism and restraint. We're honored to have him join us here today. Please join me in welcoming Representative Bob Good. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you guys today. And 
Uh, what, what's the old saying? The mind can only absorb what the seat can tolerate. So I know you guys have been sitting and listening for a little bit. So thanks for letting me share a few remarks. I'm going to try to keep my phone prominent here to make sure I respect my colleagues and appreciate the handoff from my very good friend and the very talented and courageous warrior, Dan Bishop. He is certainly one of the finest we have here in Washington. You know, as I, and again, I appreciate the American conservative for having me and for you all being here today and part of this. And I'm not on a committee that deals directly with these issues. I'm on budget and I'm on education and workforce. Of course, I'm part of the Freedom Caucus, as well as the Border Caucus and the Pro-Life Caucus and some other things. But uh, I may conclude my remarks if I get to the conclusion with the fact that while we spend most of our time in our country, most people do, talking about domestic issues, when you have a foreign uh, affairs crisis, a national security crisis, everybody is reminded about what the number one responsibility and role of the federal government is, which is the safety and security of its citizens. Part of that to protect our constitutional liberties, by the way, but also to protect us from foreign invasion and to ensure that we have a strong national defense. It's right there in the preamble to the Constitution. America, I think we all would agree, or at least probably everyone in this room and maybe half of the folks who are elected here in Washington, that America is uniquely blessed and America has uniquely been a blessing around the world. And I would submit to you that never in the history of the world before this country has the world's economic and military superpower used it for good, used it to expand freedom around the globe as opposed to conquering other nations. Think about the previous world superpowers and how many of them have used that power for good. Fact is no nation in the history of the world has freed more people, rescued more people, ministered to more people, fed more people, evangelized more people than the United States of America. And that's something that's lost a lot in our culture today and a lot in our conversations today, certainly a lot on our, in our academic situations today, is that America is the most generous and benevolent, benevolent nation in the history of the world. Uh, we are currently and historically the most welcoming nation in the history of the world to people from all races, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, all nationalities, into our country. America welcomes some one million legal immigrants a year. Now, we are a nation of immigrants and we're the most welcoming nation in the world to immigrants legally. Uh, and, and yet we are still the nation for which there's some 300,000 illegals essentially breaking into our country every month because they want By the way, this nation, which is disparaged, again, by half of the elected officials in this Capitol complex, disparaged that we're somehow a significant race in this country. And then when people come from all over the world, again, all races, all ethnicities, all nationalities, into our country illegally, they don't phone back home and say, don't come here. It's a racist, institutionally racist, systemically racist country. They don't say that. They said, y'all come. Y'all come because the Biden facilitated border evasion is, is live and well, is living and well. And, uh, no, and that's because, again, the, the, so many want to come from around the world. And you, you can recognize, uh, it's, it's almost like the, the bank robber. We know why he's robbing the bank, because that's where the money is. Maybe he's robbing the bank because he's trying to feed his family. That doesn't make it right. It's still illegal, still breaking the law. So we can understand what the draw here is to this country without, of course, condoning or tolerating uh, those who break the law to do what they're trying to do to uh, get into our country. You know, and the part of that is because no nation, again, in the history of the world has provided more upward mobility opportunity, again, to people of all races, all ethnicities, all nationalities. Where else on the planet has a minority risen to the highest level of the land, been elected to the presidency? Where has that happened? And I would submit reelected, despite doing a terrible job, because the country didn't care country didn't care what the person looked like or what the racial background is. He was voted in because, you know, people agreed with his policies, I suppose. Uh, and again, just setting a foreign policy, what nation in the history of the world who didn't invent slavery, by the way, despite what we are told by some, again, in this capital complex, but what nation in the history of the world has went to war at with itself at great loss of blood and treasure, some 600,000 lives, predominantly of the majority population, to free the minority population 74 years after we became a country. 
That's who America is. That's what America is. And I happen to have a biblical worldview. I'm a born again Christian. My faith is the most important thing in my life. You know, I, when I ran, first ran in uh, 2020, started the race in 19, but ran for Congress for the first time, I identified as a biblical and constitutional conservative. A lot of people didn't like either one of those. They particularly didn't like the biblical one. But if you have a biblical worldview as I do, there is no biblical, biblical covenant contract or guarantee for America. America's future is what we make it. Search the scriptures. If you do, I certainly do, and you will find, in my view, I don't know how you interpret it, but no reference to the United States. So our future, our history, our future history is what we make of it. And I will read one quote today. It's a famous one you've probably heard. But Ronald Reagan said, and this was in 1961. This was 15 years before he ran for the presidency. 1961. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-fought lessons of how they, in their lifetime, must do the same. See, a lot of young people in there. You will have the same responsibility my generation has that we may be forfeiting to some degree today. He continues, and if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children, our children's children, what it once was like in America when men were free. And I can tell you just even five years ago, maybe just three years ago, that sounded a lot more like hyperbole to people than it does today. And this is a, this is a foreign policy discussion, not a domestic policy discussion. But, but the, the, the world looks to America uh, to be the leader spiritually, morally, diplomatically and fiscal, fiscally, and there's no plan B. There really is no plan B. You know, George, I think it was H.W. Bush who called it, uh, called us the shining city on a hill. You know, there's no plan B. Uh, that said, a couple of thoughts just generally on, on sort of our outlook on the world and our, our what I think uh, should influence our foreign policy to some degree. Uh, foreign aid, it comes to foreign aid, you know, we should not be the world's policeman. Uh, we should not be the world's nation builder. I think we learned some tough lessons of that effect over the last 20 years. We also should not be the world's welfare provider. Uh, we can't afford, setting aside the fact that we should not do it anyway, even if we could afford it, but we can't afford to give to borrow, to continue to borrow, to give money to other nations. We should strategically sell or lend resources when it's in our national security interests. I often will say in remarks that I was not elected the fifth district representative of Ukraine or of Mexico or wherever you say, but I'm the fifth district representative of Virginia. And by the way, some of the things when it comes to foreign policy, again, as a believer, sometimes I'll hear Christian brothers and sisters try to apply biblical truth that is intended for how I'm supposed to live my life as an individual, and I fall short, to be our foreign policy. I'll illustrate that. The Bible says, turn the other cheek. I do not want that to be our foreign policy. And I don't believe that's what Jesus was speaking to when he said that. Uh, we cannot uh, make other nations become like us. Setting aside the fact that I would argue that we're, we should not. That's not, our, that's not our to make other nations become like us. But when we have tried that, if you have the absence of a respect for the rule of law, you can't build something like America. An absence for the value of life as, as preeminent. Uh, you know, you don't have a constitutional republic that we are. You don't have, and, and as, men, as much as the left would like to separate us from this, the foundation for us is our Judeo-Christian principles we were founded upon. And any honest reading of the Constitution, our founding documents, confirms that to be the case. Uh, other nations have to take responsibility for their, for their national defense. Our previous president certainly understood that, perhaps like no president, certainly in modern times. Uh, but the danger that isn't it incredible, by the way, in two and a half years, how much harm you can do to America's respect on the national stage? How much harm you can do to our military in two and a half years? How we have weakened, wussified, and wokeified our own military? You know, we, we kick... I, I said this, I had lunch with a fella today that just a, just a friend, a constituent had come up to see me, and I said to him, think about just the vaccine mandate on the military. If you had to decide to go to battle with 
one of two groups of people. I'm not disparaging anyone who did it and get the vaccine in here. But you had to go to battle with one of two groups of people. And you had to go to battle with folks who were complicit and compliant, got told to get the vaccine and just got the vaccine. Or you had to go to battle with those who said, screw that, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm freedom. I'm, I'm gonna, I own autonomy for my medical decisions. I'm not getting the vaccine. Which one do you want to get in a foxhole with? Which one do you want to fight with? And which one have we kicked out of the military? Which one have we said we do not want at a time we're not meeting our recruitment uh, goals uh, for, our, for our branches? And the Biden administration, again, has weakened the stature of the United States in an ever-changing world that much of which only respects power. This place where we find ourselves today, where I go to work every day, is a, is a place of power and persuasion, and primarily it's power. And on the world stage, uh, our adversaries only respect power. And obviously this president doesn't understand that. This is a president who, by the way, told our military the two greatest threats to the, to the country were what? He told this to the military, mind you. Climate and racism in the military. That's what they're focused on. Is it any wonder that our military has been tremendously weakened? And when you talk to those who are in positions of knowledge and expertise, they are not very encouraging what they have to say about the state of our military and the readiness and effectiveness and ability that we have to do what we would need to do if called upon in a crisis. And this is a minister, you know, nothing we spend our military resources on should have anything to do with anything but lethality. Make us, us the strongest, toughest, baddest fighting machine so that nobody wants to take us home. So that we're well equipped to avoid and then when necessary to win a war. Uh, but look at the, what's the legacy of the current administration, the debacle in Afghanistan after he promised us this would not be like you know, other such. This would not be a Saigon moment. And yet we saw what happened with Afghanistan, where, by the way, uh, not only the disastrous withdrawal, not only the loss of life of those 13 courageous warriors, uh, not only the tens of billions of dollars of assets left behind to be used who knows where by who knows whom against us, uh, de depleting our own resources, not to mention allies left behind, Americans left behind. But is this any surprise? 200,000 Afghanis, poorly if at all vetted, brought into the country during the two-week two rush to the airport. The word in Afghanistan was, you want to get to the U.S., just get to the airport. Get to the airport. And they have slowly begun to admit what we knew. They did not vet these 200,000 individuals. I went to visit some of them shortly thereafter in what was then just outside my district, now it's in my district, Fort Pickett, Blackstone, Virginia, not away county, and I don't know if anyone knows where that is, but I went to Fort Pickett to see there were 6,000 Afghanis housed there right after the withdrawal. Now, remember, what was the justification we were told on why we were bringing Afghanis to our country? They were the ones who were the what? So let me say it. The interpreters, right? The translators. One might think that to be an interpreter or translator, you might need to speak what? So as I moved through... The base, I, I, I went through the, they, did, they told me not to come, by the way. We have among our district team a, a former Marine. There's no such thing, so forgive me for saying that to my Marine friends, but uh, someone who served the Marine Corps and state trooper as well, and he's one of my district field reps. And he and I went to get, when we first tried to schedule, they, 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 uh, they, they told us they didn't want us to come. By the way, they let Miss Abigail Spanberger come, and she gave a very different report than I did. They welcomed her, but we said, we're coming. So then they gave us the official tour. After the official tour was over, we wandered through the base ourselves and gave ourselves a tour and began to interact with dozens of the thousands that were housed there, and almost none of them spoke English. Predominantly grown males, almost none of whom spoke English. Now, out of 200,000, Afghanis quickly rushed out poorly if vetted at all, what percentage would you place upon those who might be questionable actors that could pose harm to the country? 1%, so you think there's only 200? 10%, there's 2,000? Uh, actually, my math's wrong. 1% would be 2,000. 10%, 20,000. Know, what would that be? But, and by the way, right before, 
the fall in Afghanistan, the withdrawal, what flag will we be flying over our embassy in Afghanistan for 30 days? The gay pride flag. In a country where that's a big deal, by the way, and projecting that American strength, those American priorities. Uh, you know, as uh, talking about foreign policy, I want to, again, I told you I'm the budget committee, and that's kind of been the big issue of the day in the last week and all. And I want to say a word about that because every issue, every issue, is a funding issue. Every issue is a budget issue, especially today. Every issue is a fiscal issue. And I often say, you know, when you, when you, uh, I'm two and a half years here in Congress, and you have lots of constituent groups that come to meet with you to talk about the things that they're concerned about and their policy objectives and, and the things that the bills they'd like you to support or sponsor or what have you. Uh, but I will often tell them that every decision we make has to be made through a fiscal lens. And the fact is, we need to be saying, okay, should we borrow to do this? Should we borrow to do that? You realize we don't have any money. You realize we're running about a hundred, more than a hundred billion dollar deficit every month, over a trillion dollars a year. And so I often will say, you know, when you spend recklessly, wastefully, and in many cases harmfully in this administration, meaning things that are actually harming the country, uh, it makes it difficult to fund the things that you should fund, to prioritize the things that you should prioritize. Uh, you know, we have $32 trillion in national debt. That equates to about 100000 per citizen, not per household, not per taxpayer. It's about 250000 per taxpayer. Think about that astronomical number, $250,000. So how are we to adequately fund our national defense? And the current budget, the current budget, over $6 trillion, means we're spending about $20,000 per citizen from the federal government. So think about it. Your share of the federal government spending this year is $20,000, $20,000, $20,000. How many of you feel like you're getting your $20,000 share? How much of that $20,000 you think is going to stuff you want it to go to? And only about $3,000 of that $20,000 is for what I said at the beginning, what's the primary role of the, of the federal government? the safety and security of its citizens, a strong national defense, maybe even a strong border, uh, not to mention, again, protecting our constitutional liberties. So we spend about 3,000 of that 20,000 on what is, should be the primary role of the federal government. Uh, and as you know, and I see my friend Matt Gates, the courageous conservative warrior over there, you know, we just, uh, he and I voted against, as did Dan Bishop, the speaker who was right before me, and I suspect everybody that you have today, but uh, we voted against the $4 trillion increase the national debt that was voted on last week, which will make a default more likely, by the way, and make it that much more difficult for us to fund the priorities of keeping our nation safe. You know, I want to say just a thing or two about the border, uh, which, and you say, okay, well, this is foreign policy, but you know, 7 million illegals brought across the border willfully, purposely facilitated by this administration to invade our country. Boy, the, I was in a hearing yesterday. I don't remember, Peter, if it was Budge or Ed and Workforce. I think it was Ed and Workforce. And the Dems were freaking out because I was calling it an invasion. It's an invasion of drugs. It's an invasion of human trafficking. And it's an invasion of individuals from 160 different countries. Five and a half million is what Homeland Security basically acknowledges. Homeland insecurity, I guess I should say. And about 1.5 million of those Five and a half million who they, you know, we've encountered, and one, one and a half million who are the criminal gotaways. Think about that, by the way. When you come into our country, we give you free health care, free social services, free education, free travel, free housing. No court day to ever appear when you first come in. Who wouldn't want that? And yet there's a million and a half in the last two and a half years who didn't want that who evaded, encounter, they didn't, didn't come in and surrender. What percentage of that million and a half you think might be have nefarious intent? Let's say it's only 1%. That's 15,000. Would it take about 15 to do 9-11? Irreparable, untold harm has been done to this country by this president with the border invasion if we sealed it today if we sealed it today. And if you're one of the bad guys, 
why would you conduct your most nefarious activities as long as the border's open and your accomplices are still getting in? It'll be when the border gets sealed. Lord willing, January of 2025, when the border gets sealed. I mean, we're trying before that day, but we've, we've got administration. President deserves to be impeached just because of the border. I would submit that never in the history of the country, never, has our own president done more to intentionally harm the United States than what this president's done with the border, intentionally. Intentionally, it's on purpose. It is the plan, they're executing the plan. And here we have those, and my time's up, I'm gonna stop, but we will have foes who want to borrow and spend to defend other nations' borders. When we're allowing, not allowing, we're causing that to happen on the southern border. Well, thanks for letting me be with you today. Uh, thank you uh, again to the American Conservative for having me. Thanks for what you do. And I know you look forward to your next speaker. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Congressman Good. We are going to keep rolling now with our next speaker, Congressman Matt Gates. Congressman Matt, Gra Matt Gates is a proud Florida man. He represents Florida's first congressional district and is currently serving his fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. Congressman Gates is a member of the House Armed Services Committee and the House Judiciary Committee. His work in Congress focuses on national security, veterans affairs, and adherence to constitutional principles. He is a tireless fighter against the foreign policy establishment and their forever wars. Generally, that is a thankless job here in Washington, but today we thank him for speaking with us. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Matt Gates. Good afternoon, and thank you to the American Conservative. This is a remarkable platform. It is, in many ways, the launching pad for realism and focus when it comes to our foreign policy apparatus. And the American Conservative has, at times, stood alone in offering critique of the uniparty system that has let down our fellow Americans for the better part of the last half century. Uh, it is also an amazing platform. I was thinking to the gala that the American conservative held back in, I think it was December, and my colleague Dan Bishop, who you heard from today, gave the keynote at that gala, and it was a remarkable oration on the importance of political courage, and how courage is not always swimming with the large school of fish. At times it requires standing with a few or standing alone to change institutions that uh, have often been very successful and resilient in re resisting that change, and in a lot of ways, it was that speech by my colleague Dan Bishop that was like the Battle of Bunker Hill for what would then follow in January during, during the speaker's contest. And whether it's Mr. Bishop or Bob Good, who you just heard from, or my colleague Eli Crane, who you'll hear from in a moment, I could tell you that in my seven years in Washington, I have never drawn more inspiration from my colleagues. I have never felt like we have done more meaningful work to try to liberate the creativity and focus and capability of each individual member in trying to craft national policies that serve the interests of our constituents. And the American conservative has always been a welcoming place to flesh out those ideas and to have thoughtful and provoking conversation about them. Uh, most people care what I think about foreign policy not because I served in any wars or wore the uniform or heard any shots fired in anger, as, as some who you will hear from today. Uh, the reason that I have a voice of some significance on these matters is because I bought my way onto the Armed Services Committee. Uh, when I showed up here, I was deeply interested in the committee because I represent the district with the highest concentration of active duty military and veterans. And I went and met with our leadership and said, I'd really like to serve on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, the world's geographically largest Air Force base is in my district. My district is the home of the Blue Angels. We've got Army Green Berets and Rangers out in the swamps. And I, I thought that I would get really penetrating questions about my worldview and my stance on military issues. And instead, what I was told is that I needed to deliver $75,000 to the uh, NRCC in the next 10 days, and I would have a very high likelihood of serving on the committee. And I went back to my district and I was very fortunate that I had a number of folks who said, gosh, Matt, if they're selling for that price, more people may pay the price than, are, uh, than there are slots available. So my donors back in Northwest Florida gave me $150,000 to, 
to give to the NRCC. And that is the story of how I got on not only Armed Services, but the House Judiciary Committee as well, because I had double paid and they assumed I was a real comer. Uh, and, and in that role, uh, I, I've had a distinct voice. I unequivocally support very high top lines for our military. And that at times angers my dove friends. Uh, they would say, well, Matt, if you're so anti-war and you don't want to see us in, you know, spilling America's treasure abroad forever, can we push down the defense top line? And I would suggest to you that I do not want my grandchildren speaking Mandarin. I believe America always has to hold the high ground. I think that as AI and quantum computing are fused with various autonomous systems and the Internet of Things creating unique points of vulnerability in our critical infrastructure, that we have to make the investments in the strongest, most capable military on the planet Earth able to vanquish any foe. And I never want to send my neighbors and friends into a fair fight. That said, a military that is well-funded and well-supported need not be so well-worn. And that is where I often find myself in conflict with some of the neoconservatives and hawks and Boltonistas, Cheneyites, those who support the Bush, Cheney, Haley, Cheney doctrine of building Jeffersonian democracies out of blood and sand and Arab militias, believing it is in America's best interest to beat the last uh, sympathy out of the last ISIS individual in some river valley in Syria. And that is not in America's interests. And oftentimes, it has uh, shaped the views of more and more millennials who are, are entering into the, to the Congress. Uh, we have to fight when necessary. And I want to share my own evolution and thinking on this. When I first really thought about the world, I was a sophomore in college. And the normally bustling student union at Florida State University uh, was pin drop quiet because 9-11 had occurred. And we were watching these iconic buildings we'd seen. And, movies and television shows and really all of our metropolitan experiences come down. And that was a time in my life where I probably had a little more testosterone pumping through the blood and not as much wisdom through the mind. And I thought we, we must deliver vengeance. We must kill these people. We must view anyone acting in concert with them as the enemies of freedom. And I saw how people I went to high school with, uh, lived a very different life than that that they were expecting when in the year 2000 or in 99 uh, they signed up for our military uh, when folks in my graduating high school class in the year 2000 went off to west point or the naval academy it was a time of great peace there was not this expectation um, that we would engage in a 20-year conflict trading villages back and forth with the taliban in afghanistan in, in the bloodiest of possible ways and my views were shaped because my friends, my neighbors, the people I loved, kept coming home with broken limbs and broken hearts and broken marriages and broken minds. It changed the way parenting occurred. It changes the entire fabric of a community. When I played baseball, my coach wore a flight suit. When I would travel off to the state legislature, a bomb technician would watch my cat. And so when you have the impacts of these excessive deployments, it is not just the answer to some foreign policy question at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. These are kitchen table issues in communities like mine. Uh, and increasingly, folks shared with me that the wins were illusions, the costs were far too heavy, and the prospects of enduring success were dim. And we now know from the Seagal reports that these were views that were held broadly among those doing the work but that never had a sufficient impact on the decision makers in Washington, DC. And so while I did not serve in uniform, I feel the intense weight of being the representative for those who do. And at times in my community, those young sergeants will come up to me and say, Matt, you know, we wanna be able to go fight the bad guys. We wanna be able to liberate the oppressed anywhere in the world. And you're our Congressman, and we want you to stand up for our ability to go and deliver lethality downrange. And I have to remind oftentimes those young men that while I do represent them and I'm their congressman, I'm also the congressman of their spouses and their children and their parents and the neighbors who love them. And that imposes on us, I think, uh, an obligation for far more realism than the Congress has, has endeavored. 
As I look at the world today, there are really three sales pitches that get made by the major powers. Uh, if what you need is cash right now, or an infrastructure project right now, the Chinese are the best partner in the world, at least uh, presumably to many. Uh, if you want to preserve your regime, regime preservation, Russia has shown that they have a model that pitches pretty well there. Whether you're Maduro or Assad, a partnership with Russia seems to raise the floor on regime preservation. And what we are increasingly offering is uh, the best way to resolve problems with your creditors and moral judgment. Uh, if you're a country out in the world that wants to be judged by another, we're a great partner because we're going to ask you to raise the LGBTQAI plus flag for a month while the Chinese show up with suitcases full of cash and bribes and while the Russians show up with muscle to keep you in power. And whether it is our own neighborhood in Latin America where we have functionally abandoned the Monroe Doctrine or where it is Africa where the Chinese are engaging in a three card Monte game of successive coups in order to preserve long-term access to critical natural resources, uh, or whether it is in Europe where it seems we have swapped a forever war in Eastern Ukraine for the forever war in Afghanistan. I wonder sometimes, would we be in the posture we are in with Ukraine stumbling into World War III with Russia if we had not stumbled out of Afghanistan in the way in which we did? You know, who do you think writes those $75,000 checks to serve on the Armed Services Committee? In my district, there are affluent people willing to make those contributions. But if you're some poor schmuck from Northeast Arkansas or Southeast Mississippi, and you can't go raise the money from people in your district, you know where you go? The, the defense contractors and the lobbyists. And you get them to pay your dues and to pay the money that you have to offer in order to be on these committees. And then they own a lot of my colleagues. And the decision making isn't driven by realism or even one's own sincere understanding of world events. Members of Congress become but actors who are playing out parts in scripts that are written, directed, and produced by others. And look at the consequences when we don't pay attention, when we watch the shiny object. We've just learned that China is engaged in a leveraged buyout of major Russian assets in Cuba. And, and, and we watch this occur with almost a laissez-faire approach. They have intelligence capabilities now that they are building 90 miles south of my beloved Florida to be able to spy on virtually every part of the country. And we're more worried about what guy in a sweatsuit gets to run Crimea. I believe that an America first doctrine not only puts our home first, it also puts our neighbors above those who are oceans away. And that does not mean that we are not interested or engaged, but it means that we understand priority and we understand what, tr what poses a true risk to Americans. I'm far more worried about Chinese assets in Cuba or Venezuela than I am uh, whether or not a Russian tank is broken down somewhere in a stack in Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I hope that this moment in Ukraine has not reversed some of the intellectual argument that the American conservative has been so successful in advancing regarding foreign policy realism. Because in the Trump era, we were able to create a lot more open minds among candidates for Congress on the campaign trail and in primaries where we were able to go to them and say, hey, look, you don't have to be for every war. You don't have to like join the Nikki Haley view that we have to kick all of our enemies with, with our heels right, that she expressed recently in her, in her presidential campaign. I think Chris Christie said just yesterday, speaking with Jake Tapper, that the Ukraine conflict was a proxy war with China, that we were engaged in a proxy war with China over who gets to control the Donbass region. That seems to be uh, at great peril to the United States, but I, I hope that among my conservative colleagues uh, and even among populist leftists who we have at times made common cause with, uh, that what we have seen uh, with Ukraine is, is not corrosive to the productive realignment that we saw in our politics. And there are a few uh, votes that happen on the House floor that I think tell you about how that realignment's going. And it's one that seems to favor the, uni the uniparty over the rest of us. 
during the speaker contest, we got concessions out of Speaker McCarthy that he would not play the games that Speaker Pelosi played to suspend legislative days and queer the ability to bring privileged war powers motions to the floor of the House of Representatives. The, the War Powers Act says that any member can bring a war powers resolution to the floor to force a question on whether or not U.S. troops engaged in hostilities ought to come home and stop doing that. Pelosi blocked that, and Speaker McCarthy, to his great credit, allowed it. And so I first filed a war powers resolution to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. That resolution was defeated 103 to 321. But of the 103 who hung with me, it was interesting that 47 were Republicans and 56 were Democrats. Throughout the 90s, you would have thought the Republican Party is the pro-war party, the Democrat Party is the anti-war party, and now increasingly, both parties are moving toward more engagement abroad, and we seem to draw equally in our minority position, or close to equally, from Republicans and Democrats. Thereafter, we had a war powers resolution regarding U.S. troop presence in Somalia. Uh, it did about the same, 102 in favor, 321 opposed, and those in favor were 52 Republicans and 50 Democrats. In support of my Somalia resolution, and by the way, what are we trying to win in Somalia? What does victory look like there? Like, do you all want to go give more money for a sustainable Mogadishu? Is that, is that really what we're all about here as China is building intelligence capabilities in Cuba? Uh, but on that matter in Somalia, I was joined by Ilhan Omar. She came to the floor and debated in favor of my resolution. And to, you know, at, at my Baptist church the next Sunday, I got a few interesting looks about why I would partner with Miss Omar on this matter but I want, I want you to know this. I will work with anyone and everyone to end these forever wars and to have a realistic foreign policy govern this country. I thank you. And I can probably imagine that Ms. Omar had similar questions when she went to the next huddle with the squad about why she was working with me on this issue. But if the neoconservatives are going to join together with the Uniparty, then we have an obligation to join with those who can add intellectual heft and political heft. And I think that, that is, we, we have to have almost a Noah's Ark approach to adding on both sides uh, toward these intellectual goals that uh, your founding publisher, Mr. Buchanan, laid out in such terrific and, and sharp relief. And while at times it seems as though in, in this geography in Washington, DC, our viewpoint is, is one that's in the minority. I can tell you when I go out into the country, as I often do, the folks are with us. F folks truly believe that we have been engaged in too many misadventures and too much imperialism abroad. And uh, I think to the way, you know, there were a lot of reasons people reacted poorly to Liz Cheney, but the core underlying disagreement between the the Cheney perspective and the Trump perspective wasn't about impeachment. It was about foreign policy initially. And then I think it you know, erupted from there. I, I remember when Liz Cheney ran for the Senate uh, in Wyoming for the first time, she had claimed that she had been a resident of the state for 10 years based on a fishing license. Uh, that did not work out and she ultimately withdrew, which was the last time a Cheney had an exit strategy. So, <laughs> thank you all so much for having me. Let's go get them. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, I, I want to echo that as well. Uh, we, the, the American people really are with us. I spend a lot of my time as well traveling around the country, meeting with TAC readers and supporters, and uh, conservatives especially get this, this message of restraint. Well, we're going to move to our final conversation here today. We have a great one lined up for you all to, to close the conference here. Uh, if we can have uh, my colleague and our final speaker just come join us, and then I will introduce our, our final conversation here for the day. All right, well, we have a, a great conversation, as I mentioned, lined up to, to close things out for us here today. Uh, joining us furthest to my left, furthest to your right, is Representative Eli Crane. Congressman Eli Crane has the uh, privilege of serving as the U.S. Representative for Arizona's 2nd Congressional District. A week after the September 11th attack, Representative Crane left college during his senior year in Arizona to enlist in the U.S. Navy. 
And during his 13 years in military service, he participated in five wartime deployments, serving three with SEAL Team 3. He's new to Capitol Hill. This is his uh, first term here in Congress, but he's already made quite a name for himself. He was one of the 20 representatives who secured crucial concessions from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, charting a new path on how Congress goes about its business. And he continues to help Congress chart new paths as a voice for an America first foreign policy. Joining Representative Crane in, co in conversation is my colleague, our staff reporter at the American Conservative, Bradley Devlin. He is a graduate of UC Berkeley. Please don't hold that against him. But despite that, he is doing excellent work for us at the American Conservative. If you're not following all of his work, you absolutely should be. He's doing great stuff. So I will turn this over to Bradley. Well, thank you, Emil. And thank you all for being such a great audience today. Um, it's very apocalyptic looking outside. So in classic DC fashion, we decided to be a good day for a conference because um, that's what we do around here. We, we twiddle our thumbs while Rome burns down, I guess. Um, but Congressman Crane, thank you so much for joining me. Um, we've got a lot to get to. I figure we should just jump right in. Uh, as, as Emil said in your introduction, you joined the military after 9-11 in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. What encouraged you to do so? Why did you choose the Navy? Well, I think a lot of us uh, around the country did that. Um, we were just concerned about, um, you know, obviously the attacks on the World Trade Center. Um, and uh, a lot of us wanted to be the next generation that stepped up because we'd seen our grandparents do it. Um, and we know we many of us were raised in homes where we were taught that freedom isn't free. And I know I most certainly was. And so I wanted to make sure that I stepped up um, to, you know, protect and defend our country. And, uh, you know, that led to uh, definitely a very interesting uh, new chapter of my life. So you joined the Navy, five deployments, three years with SEAL Team 3, and for that, of course, you have, you have our gratitude. Um, but how did those experiences on those deployments, working with SEAL Team 3, inform your for foreign policy views that you have today? Were you always a realist restrainer or in the post 9-11 fervor, were you more of a neoconservative in your younger years? Like many of, I mean, I was a neoconservative growing up too. I think many of us go through that phase. Um, but, but what was your, how did that influence your foreign policy view? Yeah, I think I was definitely a neoconservative myself um, and definitely of the bent that I think a lot of Republicans still are, unfortunately. Um, and that, that is that we need to be involved in every single conflict um, around the world. And uh, my time overseas really affected the way I see things. Um, but honestly, of all people, President Trump really affected the way I looked at um, foreign affairs and our involvement and whether or not we were putting America and Americans first. And when I started asking myself those hard questions, even with the time that I had spent overseas, even with the friends that I had lost, uh, the treasure that we had lost, you know, I, I started asking myself some tough questions and it really helped me change um, the way I thought about um, foreign policy. And through your service, I'm sure you became familiar with this thing called the military industrial complex. Um, I guess this question is, comes in two parts. First, what experience did you have in the service interacting with the military industrial complex? And second, uh, what did you learn about it through your service? Well, the military is an interesting thing. And just to give you guys a personal story, I remember one time I was up in uh, SEAL Team 3. We were up in uh, we were up in our platoon space is what we called it. And th this was the first time it happened, but it happened regularly. Um, it was the end of the it was the end of the quarter. And my chief ran into the platoon space. It was Delta platoon space. And he said, hey, guys, guys. Um, I need you to make a list of the top 10 items that you want. I'm talking sunglasses, jacket, jackets, you know, shoes, boots, wh whatever it is, watches, knives, whatever it is. Just make, make a list of the top 10 things you need and have it to me by close of business today. And we're like, okay, what's this about? And he's like, well, um, we didn't spend all of our budget. So we've got to spend our budget because if we don't, we don't get it next time. And that's, when you, you know, I ended up becoming an entrepreneur after I left the, the, the military, but just seeing the differences between how you all, we all have to conduct ourselves in our private lives financially or as business owners, and then you watch the way the military runs completely opposite 
um, and quite honestly, the federal government runs, where is if people don't spend the money that they're given, they don't get it the next time. So there's always this, there's never an appetite to save and then reinvest the taxpayers' dollars. There's always an appetite to spend more and more and more. And it's one of the reasons that I'm up here, um, you know, getting in fights with my colleagues, Bob Good and Matt Gates, um, over, you know, trying to pump the brakes on federal spending. And I'm sure other sailors had similar reactions when the superiors would ask them questions like this. What is the, the what would you say, the overall impression that you had from others on how they view the military spending and the way that it contracts with, with military contractors? What, what was your general impression for? I think the there's the a complete complacency. I don't think that most sailors, airmen, soldiers, Marines, I don't think that they give it too, too much thought. I mean, the thought is while you're in that environment, you're, you're thinking to yourself, if I'm going to be here putting my life on the line, I want every, you know, um, piece of equipment, every piece of gear that makes, you know, me more capable of doing my job on the battlefield. So you, do, you really don't think about it too much when you're, a, you know, a, a rank and file member of the armed forces. I think that as you get older and you start looking at some of these things like nas our national debt, you know, what has been the result of these never ending wars? Um, you start asking, that's when you start really asking yourself the hard questions. So, yeah, you experience it on the tail end, and now, now you're in Congress seeing things at the beginning of the pipeline uh, and how the military industrial complex interacts with politicians. As a, as a member of Congress, what have you learned? How have you expanded your knowledge on how the military industrial complex works? Well, you got to keep in mind, I've only been here for about six months, so I'm super green. And uh, thankfully, the, the two guys that you all were, uh, you know, blessed to have come speak before you, they're both mentors of mine. And, uh, you know, it's so cool being able to listen to Matt Gates and, you know, and then being able to, uh, you know, and, and Bob Good. These guys are so smart. I think Matt is one of the um, best intellectual minds that we have up here. And I tell him that um, not to not not to make his head even bigger than it already is. Um, but I, I get on his case when Matt, does. you know, when Matt's a lot of people don't know this, but Matt's actually not in the Freedom Caucus. Did you guys know that he's not in the Freedom Caucus? And, and when Matt's not in meetings, I feel a difference in those meetings. They're not um, they're not as creative. There's not um, there's not it. They're not as hardcore. I'll just. Put it, maybe that's not the best way to put it, but and I'll tell them I'll, I'll be like, you need to be, you need to be at these meetings. We need you in there, and that's something you know that I pulled from the military is just this idea that you're you're not if you think you're going to be anything on the battlefield by yourself, you're a complete fool, and you know so teamwork is everything. Appreciating, encouraging the diversity that we have um, is so important. And Matt made a comment. He was talking about how he's never been up here in Congress and inspired by the folks that he's working with, well, I feel the exact same way. And I've come from some very high performing teams. And what I can tell you is even right now we have, even though we're a very small minority, we have, you know, we have a very good synergy. And I think it's one of the reasons that you see some of the wins, even, even though small, and even though, you know, the, the establishment is constantly pushing back on what conservatives are trying to do, I think it's one of the reasons you see some of the win wins that we have going on right now. And it's wonderful for TAC to see, uh, you know, an increasing number of allies in Congress like yourself, like Congressman Gates, like so many of the other speakers that have sp spoken today. Take us into meetings that are not House Freedom Caucus, right? We, we know that those people are friendly, but when you're talking to other Republicans uh, that are more hawkish in their foreign policy, how do you think that they come to think about these issues in that way? Why, why are they thinking about uh, continuing, the, continuing on the war path, especially in Ukraine, um, when we've just kind of meandered from failure to failure in the foreign policy space? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with our culture, right? Like I remember growing up, I remember watching movies like Rambo and Top Gun and, you know, Hulk Hogan was popular and like monster trucks. And it was like, yeah, USA. Like we were so, there was so much pride. Um, and, and, and we had this, this mentality that, hey, we're going to go try and protect other people from bullies nation, you know, all over the world, right? 
And how many of you guys have read or listened to Peter Zion? Anybody out there? He, he's an interesting uh, geopolitician that looks at indicators that a lot of people um, don't don't look at. But one of the things that he talks about is the Brenton Woods Agreement post-World War II, where basically the United States said we will subsidize world, um, you know, uh, global trading routes and in a sense world peace if you guys stand with us against the Soviet Union. And I think that I, I don't think that Republicans and a lot of America have adapted with the adaptations and as ch times have changed here economically, um, culturally. And so, you know, it, it is tough. I don't think that they've realized that we're not in the same position that we were back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Um, and my, my point is, is you have no business messing in other people's affairs when you can't get your own house in order. If, if you look at it from an individual level, none of us, it, it would be so irresponsible. Like if, you know, you have a father who's out there, you know, taking other families to dinner when his own kids are starving, that's completely irresponsible. And yet what, what happened in right here in this town last week, what did Republicans pass with the majority of Democrats? Another four trillion dollars getting rid of the cut that all the good cuts that we passed out of the house and that's why so many of us tried to take it down because we know that if you continue if you don't adapt your thinking if you don't attack the way you're you're fighting and that's how i view this whole thing i view this as warfare it's just a different type of warfare if you don't if you don't adapt in your thinking with the times it's only a matter of time before you're dead and I think that's the same with this country. And that's why I'm up here. I never wanted to be a politician. As you can tell, I don't like wearing suits. I was told by my staff I could wear whatever I wanted today. So that's why I put my, my uh, lucky ball cap, my lucky SEAL Team 3 ball cap back on. Um, and they did talk me into wearing a blazer. So you're welcome. Be, but uh, His staff texted me earlier today. Uh, how fan, is it a yeah. suit kind of thing? <laughs> so yeah. Come in whatever they, you they, want. They know. They, they know. They know me, but... But yeah, I think you have to completely adapt your thinking, and I don't think the Republican Party at this point is willing to do that. And we talked, you mentioned earlier, you know, it would be incredibly irresponsible to go meddling in other affairs when you can't get your own house in order and, you know, take that up to a national level. That's what we're dealing with now. We talked a little bit about the military-industrial complex earlier. Obviously, we need a domestic defense industrial base. I don't think you disagree with that at all. Not right. a, I mean, not at all. I still have I still have a lot of friends that are serving in the military, um, serving at the tip of the spill, spear in the military. So I definitely don't want to see them diminished. I don't want to see them vulnerable. It is important to have a strong military. I would say that's even, you know, one of the mantras um, that I subscribe to is uh, peace through strength. But how strong are you if you're thirty two trillion dollars in debt and your culture around you is falling apart? And your military leaders and commanders are often seem more focused on how woke, inclusive, diverse that their military is and, and less um, less focused on some of the things that Matt was talking about, like, you know, wh what the Chinese are up to and what they're doing. And to have a strong military, you talk about funding levels, but to have a strong military, you ought to make the weapons and equipment in the United States. Right, there was no, in, in Eisenhower's famous warning about the military industrial complex, he doesn't bemoan the fact that an industrial base in the United States exists, it's that it has gained unwarranted influence. So for you now as a congressman here, um, with all the experiences that you have, what is the proper relationship that government more broadly, not just Congress, but the government in general, should have to these corporations that we do to a certain extent need in order to make the weapons and uh, equipment that we need to fight a war. Yeah, this is one of those interesting things. I, I think a lot of people uh, believe that the military industrial complex, you know, is this massive lobbying group, which, you know, it does definitely have some pretty big lobbyists who do influence um, decision making. But I think a lot of it in large part is due to the culture that many of us grew up in that we're not willing to, you know, adapt, you know, how we do business based on um, how things are changing geopolitically, economically, et cetera. But I do want to tell you guys, um, this was one of the first experiences that I had 
Um, I can't say too much, too much about, you know, what, what we were being briefed on because it was a, a top secret brief, but I had an interesting, um, you know, uh, experience with one of the Navy's top leaders and they were briefing us on what China's Navy was doing. And so he was talking about appropriations and funding that they were going to need to kind of match what the Chinese were doing. And there were three members of the Freedom Caucus in this top secret briefing. And it was interesting because all three of us are pro-military. All three of us are pro-strength and defense but we questioned the admiral in the room. We said, hey, sir, we're all about, I, I served two and a half years on the USS Gettysburg. We're all about helping you, you know, maintain the strength of the Navy. But we're very concerned about the wokeness and, and the monies that you guys are taking that we're appropriating to you for, to strengthen our military. And you're putting towards woke programs that have nothing to do with strengthening our military. And here's the sad thing. He wouldn't even acknowledge it. At, three of us took a run at him. Three of us tried to get him to acknowledge it, um, you know, because how can you change anything if, you know, you can't communicate it, have a conversation about it? And that's that's one of the things that scares me the most is so many of these individuals that are at the top levels of our military will not even acknowledge that they are, you know, often pushing a woke agenda in our military and the fact that it costs you, the American taxpayers, money to do that. And the really simple answer or solution to that problem is, well, you change the executive, right? You win a presidential election and the, presidential, the president has a, a whole bunch of power to do, uh, you know, whatever he likes with the, with the armed forces. And of course, uh, that's easy to say, but more, much more difficult in practice. But on the legislative side, on the congressional side, what can Congress do to root out some of this nonsense that's going on in our military right now? Um, I know you... As, as Emil said in the intro, we're part of the 20 that fought for those concessions to try to hold members of the military and the administrative state uh, accountable. Those were some of the concessions that you guys got um, from now Speaker McCarthy. Uh, what, what, are, what are some of the policies that you can pursue there? How do, we, how, do we, how do we get rid of some of these generals who are doubling down on wokeism? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. One, you can you know, try and uh, hold them accountable during investigations oversight, but you can also um, try and withhold appropriations and funding if you feel like it's not going to be used appropriately. And so those are a couple different ways that, you know, you can do that. And uh, we have some folks that are committed to that mission. Unfortunately, we are a minority up here. Um, and, you know, you see that in a lot of the fights we're in. You know, and here's the deal. As the American people, I hope you I hope you guys what are we we're at the American Conservative Conference right now, right? Conservative. There's really only I'd say, even though a lot of politicians will go out on the campaign trail and they'll campaign about how conservative they are, I'd say there's really only maybe thirty-five conservatives in uh, the House of Representatives. Um, you know, and so we like I said, that's one tool that we have. Um is to try and withhold funds if when we feel like they are being abused. Did you guys know that the FBI right now is trying to build a headquarters as big as the Pentagon? You guys know that? Yeah. How, how do you think that's going to play out? <laughs> yeah. Who do you think? Who do you think that? Who do you think that they're going to continue to target? You guys know who they're going to continue to target. It's going to be you, right? And they start with the folks like you know Matt Gates or President Trump, next it'll be Eli Crane. And then if we if it keeps going and we don't stop it sooner or later, it'll be you guys. And that's what scares me. I, I'm a dad, I've got a 15 year old and an 11 year old at home. And that's the only reason I'm doing this. I, I could honestly, I could walk out in this, you know, you guys, you guys know what my goal in life is. Do you, know, you get, want me to let you in on a little secret what I wanna do with my life? I wanna buy a Winnebago and I wanna take my wife all around the country. That's what I'd love to do. But you know why I'm here? Because we're losing this country. And my daughters don't, I don't think they have a very good chance of growing up with the same levels of freedom and opportunity that I had. That's why I'm up here. That's why I do what I do. That's why I'm not popular with Republican leadership. And you know what? I don't care. I didn't come up here for that. And you know, it's, uh, I think that so many people that come up here they don't have the courage to actually do what's needed to make changes. 
It's just, it's really that simple. And it's not that they're not smart enough. They're plenty smart enough. It's that they don't have the courage to offend and piss off leadership, you know? And, and when I say that guys, it, it may sound, I may sound harsh or like I'm being crass. If you knew me personally, you would know that that's not my personality. It's not, you know, I would never intentionally just try and ruffle your feathers, uh, you know, when, when I run into you, but this is about something so much bigger than House le Republican leadership or Eli Crane. This is about this country out here. We're losing it. We are losing this country. And guess whose fault that is? It's our fault. We've been complacent. We've been asleep for a long time. Look at how many empty chairs there are in here. And I realized that, you know, you know, Matt Gates came on before me. Most people <laughs> stayed for Matt. And I don't blame you. I love hearing Matt, too. But all, all I'm saying is how many people are out there, you know, um, you know, doing something completely worthless right now that has nothing to do with saving the country, you know? And so I think that's one of the re big reasons we're in this spot. And let's, let's get into some of those, those current events that is threatening the long-term health of our nation, the long-term, you know, even prospects of this nation being what it is right now. And as, as bleak as things look right now, it can get even worse. Uh, there's no, there's no arc of history. There's no American guarantee, as uh, Representative Good said a little while back in the conference. Um, and yet, there's still this giant appetite on Capitol Hill to keep sending money to Ukraine, to keep escalating the conflict. Um, one, should we be sending aid to Ukraine of any type, military or otherwise? And two, why do you think that this appetite still exists on Capitol Hill? Why are we such gluttons for punishment? It seems like we, we just, as I said earlier, meander from foreign policy failure to foreign policy failure with no clear either entrance or exit strategy, it seems. Yeah, I think the aid we should be sending to Ukraine is envoys to usher in peace talks. That's what I think we should be doing. I think that'd be the smartest thing that we can be doing. I think that when you poke a bear, like we're, we continue to do and escalate, you know, with monies and then M1 Abrams tanks and F-16 jets and all sorts of weaponry. I think it's a very foolish move. I think that we're pushing the world towards a possible uh, nuclear World War III. And I, I, it's so it's so crazy to me. There's so many things that have gone on over the last you know couple of years that it, it it's almost like that falls on deaf ears. It almost doesn't rank. In, in our mindsets because there's been just so many crazy things going on. But it, I think it's very foolish. I think it's very dangerous. And I think we should be trying to bring about uh, peace talks because I think that that would be the best thing for the world. I think that would be the best thing for the United States of America. And just a little side story on that. One of the things I'm interested in is foreign policy. I tried to get on the Foreign Affairs Committee, but because I publicly was outspoken against you couldn't raise seventy five thousand dollars to get on the <laughs> no. yeah no i'm not uh you know i'm not as good looking and as good of a campaigner as matt gates so i wasn't able to you know go back to my donor i didn't have any big donors because uh i think they were all scared to death of me they were like this guy really we're sending this guy but um but but yeah so i they wouldn't let me on the foreign affairs committee because i was outspoken about ukraine and that just goes to show you right right there what this town is all about you know, it's like they don't they would rather have somebody that knows squat about foreign affairs, never served, doesn't know anything about it. But as long as he'll play ball or she'll play ball and do exactly what she's told, that's who they'd rather have on the committee. And all of this is to say that it seems like prospects are bleak to rein in what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, you mentioned earlier, it's like 35 actually conservative members of Congress. Um, one of the things that I've really been interested in through my writing is the presidential drawdown authority. Now, that used to be capped at $100 million a year. But in one of those big spending bills, as Washington does, you know, you were used to seeing them in December, but sometimes they do them in May. In one of those big spending bills, they decided to raise the cap to $11 billion a year. And this is May 2022, right after Russia, you know, a few months after Russia had invaded Ukraine. That cap still remains in place today. Over $21 billion has been uh, funneled to Ukraine using the presidential drawdown authority. Are there prospects for 
uh, con conservative members of Congress to try to reinstitute that cap? I think there's prospects for us to do a lot of things. Um, but I think if we're being real, we, we've got to be realistic about this. We've got to have our eyes wide open. Right now, I can't, we, we can't even get the Republican conference to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. Like, I don't know what else that guy has to do. I don't know how many, you know, more Americans have to die, how many more thousands of Americans have to die by fentanyl, how many communities have to be, you know, oppressed by MS-13 gang members, how many more sex trafficking victims have to come into the country, all the while he lies to us and tells us that he has operational control over the southern border. We can't even get some of these, you know, things that are just so obvious to me done. And so I'm going to tell you guys right now, one of the only ways that I'll be able to stay up in this this swampy town for a couple more terms is to be realistic and keep my expectations low. One thing, the only thing I can control is my vote, my voice, my influence, and my effort. Outside of that, I can't control this town. I can't control this conference. And so um, it's one of my big frustrations. While we're $32 trillion in debt, we continue to ship money that we don't even have over to one of the most corrupt places in the world. Um, you know, and uh, but like I said, there are so many other things on so, you know, that we're trying to get accomplished that, in my opinion, are even more obvious than that one that we're not able to to get over the finish line at this point. And I'm hoping that if we keep at it, we keep grinding, we keep pushing that, you know, we'll be able to get some of these wins. But stay tuned. Is there is there a pitch to be made to Republican members of Congress who might be more hawkish, but are still um, oriented towards limited government, oriented towards uh, exercising congressional authority to go to them and say, hey, you know, we might disagree on Ukraine, on Ukraine funding, but at the end of the day, Congress has the authority, the constitutional authority to do something about this. Why don't we take that control back to ourselves instead of giving it over to a uh, a senile president. Why? Why do we keep handing over this control? I, you know, maybe maybe the cap's not a hundred million as it once was, um, but maybe we ought to take that power back for ourselves. Is is that a pitch? Is that a winning pitch? Do you think they're going to be receptive to that, or do you think too many con uh, members of Congress, specifically on the Republican side, are just kind of content in not doing their job and showing up to congressional hearings and getting their soundbite? Um, you know, are are they? Are they actually wanting to exercise the power that the Constitution gives them? Well, I think a lot of it is a lot of the folks up here are sheep. They really are. They're not lions. They're sheep. And they do what they're told. And they, they just follow wherever they're led. And when you have the leaders of the body who feel a certain way, completely opposed to me, a lot of these folks who care more about their political careers, who care more about what committees they're on, who care more about climbing the political ladder, um, follow those leaders this is the byproduct of it. And so, so I think that's a hard thing for people to understand is oftentimes it's, you can make the best argument in the world, but it's not about, you know, convincing somebody a lot of the time. Sometimes it's about power. And that's what this town, unfortunately, often is about. And you, you can see people that come up here and they're good people and they do want to do good things. But a lot of them rationalize it in their mind by saying, well, if I'm really going to make a difference then I have to get that, I have to get on that committee. And then if I'm really, really going to make a difference, I have to become a committee chairman. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like, go talk to Andrew Clyde right now. Ask Andrew Clyde what happens when you buck the rules in this town. The sec your Second Amendment rights are being toyed with and played with, and millions of Americans right now are uh, on the precipice of being uh, felons because the Republican Party and Republican leadership threatened a member of the House Freedom Caucus because uh, and his le putting his legislation on the floor because he would he, he didn't want to vote for the rule of this monstrosity debt bill last week. And so, again, this town is about power. That's really what it's about. And they care less about actually representing and taking care of the American people than they do about um, power and influence and everything that comes along with that. And I, guys, I know that's really depressing. It depresses me too. Um, but it's kind of the reality up here. And this is, is this something that you believe but was confirmed when you came to Congress? 
Was it something that you picked up on the campaign trail, or is it something that you've that this it, grim it, look? Yeah. Is, is it something that you've just learned? No, it's something that I absolutely believed. I think many of you believe it. Then when you get to see it go down right in front of you, yeah, it, it's con it's confirmed 100%. Does that? Am I trying to say it's hopeless? No, I'm not trying to say it's hopeless. Um, I, I honestly believe, and I know this isn't always popular, might be more popular in this room, hopefully, but um, I honestly believe one of the most important things we can do is, is pray and ask God for um, protection, guidance, favor, peace, uh, and blessing. And I think that's, um, I, you, you won't hear a lot of politicians talk like that because you, you might offend somebody, right? But I honestly believe that it's one of the most powerful things that we can do. And I do believe one of the most, uh, the biggest reasons our country is in such a disaster, such a disarray, our culture has gone completely mad is because we've pushed, we've allowed God to be pushed out of everything. And when you allow God to be pushed out of everything, this is the byproduct complete insanity. I mean, it, you guys know the deal. We need, you need to be a biologist now to, you know, actually have a, a authoritative position on what a woman is, right? It's, it's, in, it's insanity. Right. We want women on the front lines, but also we don't know what a woman is and all that, so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, you see such a blatant ideological commitment by the executive, by the administrative state, um, you know, it's, it's June. Um, they once again want to make sure that there are pride marches in Kiev, um, as one administra administration official, uh, I believe, once remarked. Um, do, are those ideological commitments that we see so often coming out of the administrative state the same when it comes to supporters of Ukraine in Congress? Um, or... Is it for different reasons? Is it much more cynical? Is it much more the Lindsey Graham? You know, this is the best money we've ever spent. A bunch of dead Russians, thank goodness. Um, or, or is it just kind of this blind ideology? I think you touched on it a little bit earlier with, we're still kind of playing catch up with just how far away our, our country has fallen from what the founders intended it to be. Um, but, but what do you think? Is it, is it as ideologically driven as it seems to be in the administrative state in Congress or is it a bit different? I think there's a bunch of different things there. I think, you know, we talked about the cultural aspect, the idea that, you know, many of us have believed for a long time. And in, in some cases, I still do that the world is a safer, better place when the United States is involved. That being said, if we're not putting America first, if we're not putting Americans first, we're not, I don't think we're going to get back to that peace through strength because we won't have that strength part, which is core in that, that whole ideology. I think another big Another big bucket of this, is, and we're learning more and more about this each and every day, is the corruption of the Biden family. And, you know, a couple couple years ago, maybe even six, nine months ago, that might have been seen as conspiracy theory. But when you look at what's been coming out in over, oversight and judiciary and they're actually look, we actually have members of our party looking at the receipts and the monies that have been paid, you know, to the Biden family. And then you have you you tie it together with, you know, Tony Bobolinsky, you know, who did an interview with Tucker Carlson, who's not even a Republican. The guy votes a Democrat who is doing business with the Biden family, saying that, yes, Joe Biden is the big guy. That's who's getting 10 percent, these 10 percent kickbacks. I mean, it's like I'm telling you right now, if this were if this were the Trump family that they had this dirt on these receipts on these bank receipts on these guys would be in jail like that. And it's just um, so. So. Which which countries were given which countries were given Hunter Biden money, Joe Biden money? Yeah, Ukraine, China. Yeah, they say, they often say follow the, follow the money, and I think that I think that that is part of it. I really do. You know, how, I mean, how much money was uh, Hunter Biden being paid to be on the board of Burisma? It's a hundred thousand dollars quarterly, right? Something like that. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you've seen him paint, he probably deserves every penny. I mean, he was probably decorating all of their, you know, all of their boardrooms with his beautiful painting. I'm being sarcastic guys, but you know, it's one of the, it's one of the mechanisms that I vent my frustrations up here uh, with. We actually have a decent gym in, in the house too. And I get to go to that occasionally. So that, that's another way I do it. But um, yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it too. There's the definite aspect of corruption. Um, it, there's a lot of literature that you can go out there and read on elite capture. 
It's something that we do to other countries. It's something that countries do to us where you basically try and um, blackmail, influence, or capture high-ranking elites politically, culturally, etc., and then use you know whatever blackmail, whatever leverage you have on them um, to get them to do your bidding. And I think you are most definitely seeing some of that right now played out in live color. And when you when you started uh, your remarks, and to, to my last question, you talked about this piece, you know, peace through strength, having a strong military. Ukraine and the aid that we're giving to Ukraine uh, is depleting U.S. stockpiles. Javelins, stingers, all sorts of munitions. Uh, stockpiles are in, are in bad shape, and it makes us ill-prepared to confront an enemy like China, though I don't think any of us wish war with China. Um, it makes us unprepared to meet those challenges. Um, what kind of a national security risk does our depleted stockpiles pose uh, to our to our homeland security, to our national security? What 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 is uh, you know? It's it's not going to just be like oh we can start up manufacturing again. Um, there's some serious logistical hurdles to climb. Not to mention that it's. Uh, much easier to fire a rocket than it is to build one. Um, what, what do you think about the depleting stockpiles for the U.S. military right now? I think it's extremely foolish and, and very dangerous for a couple reasons. One, we do have, I would consider, um, much more serious and long-term allies like um, Israel and Taiwan that I think are in hot, boiling water right now. And I think uh, um, those two countries specifically, you know, have death, you know, are definitely, um, I think it behooves us to defend them a lot more than it does Ukraine for multiple reasons. So you've got, you've got that aspect of it. Um, and then we, we keep talking about that peace through strength quote. It's really simplistic. Um, you know, it's, it's only a couple words, but that strength part is so important to it. Um, it's like a bully on the block, right? You know, bullies are always, you know, they're always rambunctious and uh, willing to do whatever they want until, you know, uh, the, the big kid who's actually got a little moral courage steps up and punches them in the nose or has the capability to do so. And I think as we deplete our stockpiles, um, this is stuff that's discussed openly in congressional hearings. It's not like the it's not like our adversaries don't know this. Um, so I, th I think that you'll see more aggression as we deplete our stockpiles in a war that I don't think that we should be involved in. And then let's be honest. I mean, as we talk about our own security, our own safety, our own defense, I mean, we have a wide open southern border right now. Even though Secretary Mayorkas will tell you to your face that he has operational control over it. You know, I mean, we had a Chinese spy balloon fly over the U.S. for a week. You know, what what intel do you think that 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 balloon got um, there, you know, the Chinese have police stations in the U S right now. Um, and, and they, they have their tentacles in probably most of the massive corporations that we have, they have their tentacles all over this town. Um, and they're able to do so because so many of our elites, um, have been captured or corrupted, if you will. And we've, we've talked quite a bit about the threat that China poses today, and, and that's definitely worth the time that we've given the issue. Um, Can I say something real quick on that, though? Yeah. This is one, th this is one area that actually surprises me. Um, every once in a while, I'm surprised by something here in Washington, D.C., um, and I'm actually surprised that my colleagues on the other side do consider China to be a threat. And I say I'm surprised because, you know, um, it is it is surprise we're so polarized politically in this country now that if it it's almost as if we think one thing they inherently think the other and vice versa so that's one good i think that that that's one good thing is that you know most members of congress that that i've run into do acknowledge the threat that china is which i do think is a you know a shiny little lining of hope in there um and then it comes to being actually ready to, con to confront China, right? It's great that they're talking that talk, but now we got to get them to walk the walk a little bit. Um, are there, th can Congress move to try to limit the capacity of the Biden administration to further deplete those stockpiles? What are, what are the controls, what are the levers of power um, that we can play with to try to preserve other than just, you know, an appropriations bill every few months to, to preserve our military's readiness 
um, uh, it, contra to you know the Biden administration's wishes. Yeah, that's something that we're actually looking into right now. Um, what we can do to try and preserve some of our stockpiles, and we're we're reaching out to other members and even some outside um, sources to try and uh, figure out what would be the best, most effective way to do that legislatively to where we could actually get some support for it. And I guess to close out, um, and then we'll open up the floor to some questions. Where do you see this conflict in Ukraine heading um, if it's not solved peacefully soon? Um, and what do you think the ripple effects of that will be? Um, are, are you are you saying that if we can try to, <laughs> I don't think you are saying this, but some have said, you know, you can kind of push it to a stalemate and there's just going to be this kind of boiling but not, you know, molten hot, exploding volcano of a war in Europe. And, and that's a tolerable situation to be in. I don't want to be in that situation. I think uh, Europe doesn't want to be in that situation. And I know, definitely know Ukraine and Russia don't want to be in that situation. So if this, if this war does not wrap up soon, where do you think it heads from here? And, and how does it impact the geopolitical uh, arena beyond that of continental Europe? I think it, you know, has the, and I, I'm clearly not a fortune teller, Nos, Nostradamus, anything like it. Um, so I'm not going <laughs> to. Don't place any bets on right. DraftKings based on that's Representative right. that's Crane's right. advice. But I do think it has the potential to escalate into a, a nuclear war where a lot, you know, a lot of Europe gets destroyed and then the American taxpayers are once again on the hook to come in and rebuild you know, those areas as if we have the money anyway. But, uh, you know, this this could go so many different ways, which is why I'm always big a big believer in controlling what you can control, which is why I said I think what we need to do, which is something we could control, is we need to start, uh, you know, ushering in peace talks and bringing both sides to the table to try and find a resolution. Join me in thanking Congressman Crane for his time. We've got about... Five minutes. We've got about five minutes, so we'd be happy to field a few questions, probably two or three. Um, does anyone have any questions? You want to call on? All right. I really don't have a question, but I want to. I want to commend you <clears throat> for mentioning the the ultimate problem of the lack of uh, God in the discussion, and I've. I've seen a very high correlation of the 35 conservatives that you're talking about and their, their willingness to talk about the absence of God in the considerations. Um, I, I just want to commend you on that and all 35 of you for um, getting to the root of the problem. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. You know, um, some of you guys might know this verse. Um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it memorized, but I think it's in Second Chronicles. But it, you know, it talks about. You know, I think you know, God's talking about Israel, but you know, basically, you know, in, any nation that will turn back to me and repent, I will, I will save and restore their nation. And it's like we are so far from that. We have, put, like I said, we have pushed God out of everything. If God says, you know, if God says one thing, if God says A, this culture immediately says, nope, that's not true. It's B. I mean, God said, I created you male and female in Genesis, the very first book. What does this culture say? Nope. No, God, there's 107. No, there's 300 genders, right? And I don't, honestly, I don't care where you guys wind up on that. I, I would assume most of you have the same um, point of view that, or maybe close to it than I do. But that's not really even the point. The point is, is that this town, the biggest thing this town lacks, sir, is courage. There's a lot of people out there that ha have the same beliefs that I do. They have the same faith that I do. They, they understand how important faith and our Judeo-Christian founding is to the success of this country, but they won't say it because they're scared. And they're more concerned, as I said before, about their own political careers than actually speaking truth. And that's, it's, it's a sad day, but it's, it's once again why guys like me who never wanted to be politicians are sitting in front of you today because I said, oh my God, are you serious? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to jump back into this fight, and I'm gonna have to put a suit and a a tie on occasionally. You know, so I appreciate it, and we'll continue to try and speak truth, sir. 
Yeah, yeah. impeaching DHS Secretary Mayorkas, uh, you said there's not a there's not a majority for in the House, uh, the Republicans to do that. I would assume that's a tactical question that they think well, it's not going to end in success. It's a waste of legislative effort because I imagine that there's a wide consensus that he's a failure and a disaster, and he's not crim he's criminally liable for what's happening at the border. But is that the case? I mean, I would see the the argument that impeaching him brings out all of these defects. It brings out the legal uh, issues as well as the political issues, regardless of whether he is in, is removed by the Senate. But maybe there's another insight on that story. Thing. No, it's a it's a very good point. It, it's it's one of the most I think it's one of the biggest reasons that a lot of folks don't want to you know impeach Mayorkas. There's also the question of has he committed high crimes and misdemeanors. The 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 way I look at it is this: the American people are so fed up with this town. They're so fed up with politicians. They're so fed up with our party. And I don't blame them. They want, they're desperate for somebody to fight for them. They, they, feel like, they feel like all that goes on in this town is theater and sellout. Theater, sellout, repeat. Theater, sellout. So my point is, hey, fire him. Impeach him. Will they bring in somebody as bad or worse? Absolutely they will. But at least the American people will know that somebody's fighting for you. They're tr we're tr up here trying. And, 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 and that restores hope. And hope is one of the most powerful things that we have as human beings. And right now, the American people have very little, which is why I think it's so important that we show them that, yes, we are fighting for you. There's not, a, there's not two standards, one for you know, high-ranking political if, elites and one for you and your job where you can just show up do the exact opposite of what you've been hired to do, but you get to hold on to your job, but not Joe Biden, not Secretary Mayorkas. Those guys have political cover, and, 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 and so therefore we're not going to do it. And that's why I think it's so important. we got time for one more question. I, I was very interested in your comment where you talked about how you were talking to the generals and about the wokeism, and they didn't seem interested or even worried about it. Um, as a geopolitical researcher in China, uh, uh, cons uh, cons geopolitical consultant in China, as well as researcher, uh, I've come across some videos where, say, the PLA has done videos where they show Marines waving the LGBT flag and doing the, you know, the drag performances, and then they'll show a, a scr screenshot of of the PLA. Uh, doing very hardcore Rambo style military stuff. Uh, is the Pentagon aware of, uh, of this type of imagery? And, and this is perhaps a reason why the enemies of the US are becoming more aggressive because they see this wokeism? 100%. I mean, just as any, any enemy of yours, if they, if they believe that they saw weakness in you, would become more aggressive and more willing to make a move. I mean, this is this is old as time. This is just straight up nature. I mean, you go go watch the Discovery Channel tonight. You'll see the same thing play out with lions, gazelles, and wildebeest. And it's it's happened. It is most certainly happening here. You know, it's terrifying for those of us that came out of those. You know, the the service. You know, the, the military, and we're like, what are you doing? These are some very serious enemies and opponents that we have around the world. They're watching not only um, our, our weakness on full display, but they're also watching the division. And that's one of the things that we have to understand. We'll never win a fight that we don't understand. And that's why, that's why a lot of, and, and uh, you know, go Google this guy. Go Google Vody Bakum cultural Marxism. This stuff is cult a lot of this stuff that's destroying and eating away at our country is Marxism. It's not economic Marxism as they've tried to use against the West in the past. It's cultural Marxism. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. And that's exactly what Marxism does. Instead of trying to d divide us up between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, as you know, your more traditional Marxists did, that didn't work here in the West because we were too prosperous. But what has worked here in the West? They point at some of our, our history, right? They point, they, they, instead of inserting economic class, what do they insert? They insert race, racism, 
ethnicity, and they divide us all up into these little groups. And it's, I mean, it's a real study. It's very, you know, you, you got to really get into it to understand it. The intersectionality, there's so, there's, there's so much going on in there, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. One last thing that I, I highly recommend that you watch, go watch, if you haven't watched already, is go Google Yuri Bezmenov. Anybody know who Yuri Bezmenov is? Ex-KGB defector. Came here and talked about the KGB's plans um, to destroy America without ever firing a shot and how we silly Americans think that they spent more, spend a lot of their budget on the fancy James Bond espionage type stuff. He says, no, we don't, we don't spend our, mo our money on that. We spend our money on ideological subversion within your own country. We do, it in your, we do it in your schools. We do it within your media, within your culture. And he talks about the, he even goes into the phases of it and, and how long each phase takes. Go Google that and, and then have yourself a stiff drink ready after it because um, it's, it's depressing. And I realize my whole talk has been depressing today. <laughs> yeah, thank <laughs> you for so, taking the black pill with I'm us. I'm sorry everybody. for that, guys. But, you know, it's like if, if, there's, there's so much of this rah, 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 nonsense crap in politics where people just they put on the little blue suit with the red tie and the American flag pin. And then, you know, they sit or they, they, they go and they they, they tell you that we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do this. I'm not that guy. I'm not going to do it. Um, I've gotten in every fight I can get up in up here. I'm going to continue to do that. I'm going to continue to fight for this country I love, but I won't. I won't feed you a line of BS and I'll tell you exactly what they're trying to do. I'll tell you, you know, who on our side needs more encouragement to actually step up and fight with those of us that are, you know, laying it down every day. But, um, I do apologize that the last speech of the day wasn't more, uh, it, you know, uh, what hopeful. Well, it fits with the, the smoke in the background. And so thank you for taking the black pill with us and, uh, please thank one more time Congressman Eli Craig. All right. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Just a few parting notes for all of you. Um, I actually I love the, the note of hope that the Congressman mentioned there. It wasn't all discouragement. And that was one of my takeaways here today as well, uh, is that we should be hopeful about the future of our country's foreign policy. We certainly have a lot of work to do. We heard that today as well. Uh, but we have a lot of great people up here in Washington now, like all of the speakers that you heard from today, uh, working to, to restrain our foreign policy and bring it back into its constitutional limits. A few housekeeping items. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, please do take a copy of our latest issue of the magazine with you. And if you are so inclined, if you're no, not yet a member of the American Conservative, please do take advantage of that special offer as well. There's a QR code on the program. So take that home with you. Become a member. Join us. Join our movement to reclaim a Main Street uh, vision for conservatism. I also want to thank the staff of the American Conservative who worked tirelessly to put on this conference here today. Uh, most especially Sean Riley. As I mentioned, he spearheaded this conference. So I want to thank him and our generous sponsors who made this possible. Stand Together Trust, F. Francis and Dio Najafi of the Pivotal Foundation, and Vladimir Egger. So thank, thanks to all of you for coming, and we'll see you all next year.